possible by generous donations from those touched by integrative medicine around the globe. We hope you too will consider supporting our work, such as the annual event, our Sung Symposium. The event was named the Sung Symposium in honor of the generosity of the Sungs and was first held in 2018. The Sung Symposium promotes the use of integrative medicine and has had several themes, including most re recently, resiliency and well-being, and now the gut and its microbes. To kick off this year's Sung Symposium, we are fortunate to have Dr. Leslie Davidson, Chair of the Department of Clinical Research and Leadership here at the GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Thank you so much for joining us to give the opening remarks, Dr. Davidson. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lee. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's attending. I think this is the largest um, out of the six symposiums that we've had. So we have over 300 registrants really from all over the world who are with us today. And that's really exciting. Um, I think, you know, I, this isn't part of my formal remarks, but something that's really important is that one reason I love this symposium and I love the Office of Integrated Medicine and Health and the commitment that GW has around this area is that little by little we're changing healthcare from these silos of specialists to really understand the depth and breadth of the body, the mind, the environment, the soul, the spirit, and how all of these contribute to health. And, and that's what the Office of Integrative Medicine is really all about. And the Sung Symposium um, helps to meet one of the missions, which is education and community outreach. So I wanna welcome everybody today who's part of the sixth annual symposium. And you're gonna hear from a number of specialists, but this is really a community event. And so I hope that people really contribute to these rich discussions after everybody presents. Um, and Leah talked about the fact that the, that the Office of Integrative Medicine and the symposium is really made possible by um, Patrick and Marguerite Sung, as well as other people who have given um, over the years. And the mission is, of the center is threefold. It's advancing integrative medicine and health and the evidence around it, community education, as well as education. And so the Sung symposiums have, have really uh, worked to promote this whole health approach to patient care, and it gives providers and community members an array of evidence that can be used um, to understand health and wellness and disease prevention and treatment options that are available to them. In the past six years, uh, Lee mentioned a couple of them, but the symposiums have talked about general healing, brain health, longevity, whole health, resiliency, and well-being, and today we're talking about gut health, more specifically the gut microbiome. So I spent just a few minutes today and I went on to Google Scholar and I, I looked to kind of, I know that this is a uh, wildly growing field, but I wanted to see how much it's growing. So I went to Google Scholar and I, and I looked for references between 2014 and 2017. And I was actually surprised as to how many hits came up. 75,000 hits came up between 2014 and 2017. But then I looked between 2017 and 2020 and it was almost double. Right, so we had about 100, there were about 136,000 hits came up between the next three years, 2017 and 2020. Then I thought, well, if I go from 2020 to 2023, since we're only a few months into 2023, it's not gonna be that impressive. I was, I couldn't have been more wrong. Between 2020 and 2023, so far, we have 167,000 hits. So we went from 75,000 to 136,000 to 167,000 hits on Google Scholar. So this is a hot topic. So whether or not we're talking about the gut microbiome and what it is, or whether or not we're talking about how the gut contributes to health or to longevity, or the impact of COVID-19 on our gut. The list goes on and on and there's research that is coming out like wildfire. And so I can't think of a more salient topic for us to talk about today. And um, Lee and Janet and members of this team have put together a panel of experts who are gonna share their knowledge, their expertise, and continue to advance this area of inquiry. So I'm honored to have opened this up 
um, for today's events. And I want to thank everybody who has um, put time into this event, um, specifically Janet Rodriguez, who is kind of, you know, our, our North Star and making sure this happens, um, and Lee Frame as well. Um, so I hope everybody in, enjoys this afternoon and leaves here with some tools and knowledge that they can bring home with them and um, and use in their practice or use in their life. Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was wonderful. And now we will jump into our first talk. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn over the microphone to Dr. Misha Kogan. You're on mute, Misha. Of course most common sentence in the room, right? Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm so excited that I get a pleasure and honor to introduce our first speaker. Um, uh, Scott, Dr. Scott Johnson has a, a very distinguished career. He completed actually two different PhDs from uh, University of Maryland and also John Hopkins in biochemistry and biophysics. I think that fit alone will put him out there. Um, and he, uh, from the early career, he concentrated on the microbiome First, he started by his research in uh, uh, looking at the yeast models. And then uh, in 2014, he joined NIST, which is a National Institute of Standards and Technology, after 11 years of being principal investigator at FDA, where he studied uh, global genomic diversity of enteric pathogens uh, for food safety and public health. And at NIST, he's currently the leader of the complex microbial system groups in the uh, biosystems and biomaterial division where he studies how to improve microbiome and metagenomic measurements. And this is a hand, handful of words. So I'm sure he will explain that to us in a lot more details. And so, so the, his lab is developing reference materials and reference methods uh, and for the in vitro tools to better understand microbiome, particular micro, microbial community resilience and evolution. And on a personal note, I'm a huge fan of Scott's um, he recently, I think about it maybe less than a year ago, he did part of the Appalachian Trail, which is my dream. And I just heard a couple of days ago that he's going to go back there soon. Um, and so with that, um, Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for joining on us and take us on the journey of your talk. Thank you, Misha, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, thanks for the organizers for inviting me. It's a real honor and pleasure to be here and uh, share with you some of the work that we're doing at NIST and also give you an overview of the uh, uh, the exciting field of microbiome. Uh, I'm probably going to struggle through this as I picked up a upper respiratory something or another earlier this week, and I'm at the stage now where I'm starting to lose my voice. So uh, I've been quiet all morning trying to uh, reserve my vocal cords for this, but uh, nevertheless, I'll jump right in. So Misha mentioned that I'm, uh, I, I'm at, I'm, I work at NIST, and I know a lot of people aren't familiar with NIST, so I, I feel obligated to introduce NIST. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and we're a non-regulatory federal agency in the Department of Commerce. Uh, we're the oldest technical institute in the U.S. government, dating back to 1901. Uh, we have two large campuses, one located in Gaithersburg, Maryland, where I'm sitting right now, and also in Boulder, Colorado. Pictures of them are on the, uh, as you can see. Uh, if you look closely, I bet you can guess which of these campuses is in Boulder. Uh, we're about 5,000 scientists and engineers strong, uh, about a billion dollar annual budget. And, you know, when I say technical institute and the Department of Commerce, sometimes I get some wonky sideways looks. Like, why does the Department of Commerce need a technical institute? Well, our mission is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology. So we really see industry and industrial competitiveness and development as, you know, sort of our stakeholder. A fun fact, actually, this is just something I learned uh, last month uh, when, I, when I was reading an article in Science about NIST. Every, every dollar of taxpayer money that's invested in NIST returns $9 to the U.S. economy. Um, which I, I thought that was kind of nice to see your tax tax dollars hard, hard at work. So in the biosciences division at NIST, we think a lot about the bioeconomy. And that brings me to why does NIST uh, uh, work in the microbiome space? And it's because there are hundreds of companies, large and small, that are developing products that target the human microbiome. And when I say large and small, I mean like big pharma that you can see here, like Pfizer 
and you know small startups that may be just a, a few people who uh, you know came from an academic lab where there was some exciting discovery that they felt had commercial potential and and uh, and stepped out into the exciting world of entrepreneurship. So you know when I justify my existence at NIST, this is sort of the uh, the, the slide that I show and discuss the uh, bioeconomic ramifications and, and implications of, of microbiome science. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, as the first speaker, I was asked to provide a, you know, a general overview of what we're talking about today, the human microbiome, more specifically the gut microbiome. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> the human microbiome is defined as all the microbes that live in and on our bodies. And these include bacteria, of course, but also viruses, protists, fungi, and other little things. Um, fun fact. <clears throat> there are more microbial cells in and on your body than there are human cells. Uh, the exact ratio there has been hotly debated. It used to you know, be thought it was like a 10 to 1, and then some said it was fewer, but I think the, the scientific community agrees that there's, there's more microbial cells than human cells. And these are largely found in your gut. That's a, where a majority of your uh, microbiome resides, but they're also in your skin and your, your genital tract and uh, on and on. The, this is not a monoculture of bacteria. There are literally thousands of different species of bacteria that reside in and on your body. And in our gut, you know, you might have hundreds of different species of bacteria that form a resilient ecosystem. You know, these things aren't operating in silos. They are a community that work together as a community. And a community function and outcome, also known as maybe a phenotype, can impact your health. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note that our, our, the human microbiome contains about 3.3 million non-redundant microbial genes. And just for context, compare that to the human genome, your human genome, that contains about 22,000 genes. So many of these genes contain enzymes that, you know, transform biochemical processes. So you can imagine, you know, this extremely rich potential of biochemical transformations that can and do exist within your gut microbiome. Our, our uh, microbiomes impact us metabolically, neurologically, immunologically, and hormonally. And that pretty much covers, you know, end to end, uh, everything happening in our bodies. And to make things more complicated than they, they have to be, every individual on earth is very unique with respect to their microbiomes. And, you know, in many cases, you know, individuals, even closely related, uh, you know, husband, wife type uh, uh, relationships only share a small percentage of their, their microbiome, you know, on the order of about 10%. Um, you know, take that into the context of the, if you think about our human genomes and our relatedness as homo sapiens, we're all about 99.9% .9 related as homo sapiens. But if you look at our microbiomes, we're only about 10% related. And this brings me to the, the last most poignant uh, um, statement is that the human microbiome plays an important role in human health and disease and represents an understudied and underappreciated target for new diagnostics and therapeutics. And maybe that statement's a little bit outdated because I think now we know that it is a, uh, we appreciate uh, its implications in health and disease. And, uh, you know, all of those companies that I had mentioned in the previous slides and academic labs, et cetera, you know, those are the ones that are developing these clinical applications of the human microbiome. So uh, to be sure, uh, earlier today, uh, when I was uh, putting together uh, some of these slides, I did a quick search on clinicaltrials.gov for microbiome keyword and found uh, 3,400 studies. Uh, you know, some of these have been completed, some are enrolling, some are recruiting, some are ongoing, but 3,400 clinical trials that include uh, the keyword microbiome. And, and if you just do a quick scan down the list here, and this is just eight out of 3,400, you can see, uh, you know, uh, the microbiome of pancreatic cancer and, uh, you know, the vaginal microbiome, ocular microbiome and immune system and dry eyes and on and on and on and on. Yes, there is a lot of hype. Um, you know, I, I always 
uh, gets get uh, a little nervous when uh, you know you're standing in line at the grocery store checkout line and you're looking at the magazines and on the cover of one of these magazines is something about your microbiome and I think oh. Um, so here's just one of those, you know, a 16 week vegan diet can do wonders for your gut microbiome when in fact, we don't really know what a good microbiome or a bad microbiome is. I know that's a little disheartening to hear, but it's true. So while we could debate whether a vegan diet is good for you or not, we really don't have any way to measure how good it is on our gut microbiomes. And this brings me to this Gartner hype cycle, which is um, you know, something that kind of describes new technologies. And when a new technology comes out, you know, not many people know about it, but then, you know, the, the media catches on and you get this peak of inflated expectations where everyone says this is the next huge thing and it's going to change the world. And then, you know, reality sets in and there's this trough of disillusionment, uh, you know, the slope of enlightenment. And then finally, you know, we plateau off to some productivity. Where microbiome is on this on this uh, curve, I, I don't know. I like to speculate and uh, I don't know, maybe Maybe we're on this side of the trough of disillusionment. Maybe we're still on this side of trough, trough of disillusionment. I don't know. Um, uh, Leo, Janet, can someone confirm that you can see my pointer? I just want to make sure that I'm not pointing just from my own. Uh... I cannot currently see your pointer. OK. Oh, now, now I can see it. Yes, when you move. Uh, OK, I was pointing at the wrong screen and thinking that you all could see that. Thank you, Lee. Uh, so at any rate, I was just pointing out, I don't know if we're on this side of the trough of disillusionment or this side, but uh, we're somewhere along the way. While there is a lot of hype, I only show that to point out there's also a lot of really, really good science behind this. So one of, I think, one of the biggest uh, exciting discoveries with microbiome science in the last 10 years is the realization that the human gut microbiome modulates the efficacy in response to immunotherapies in cancer patients. And this discovery was published in three back-to-back-to-back -back -back papers in science in 2018, where it was discovered by, you know, simultaneously by three different groups looking at this. So, you know, if you'd seen it once in a small group, you would say, ah, maybe, maybe not. Um, but, you know, this is this was a, re uh, you know, a real uh, discovery and a really important one too, because, you know, these immunotherapies that are used in cancer patients or, you know, really life-saving treatments. And what they have found is that if you can modulate your gut microbiome or change it to a more compatible or healthy state, that the outcome of your immunotherapy treatment uh, could be more uh, positive. And this is in 2018. So this is five years ago. And uh, a lot of the oncologists that are on these papers have sort of shifted a lot of their focus of their research to understanding this relationship between the gut microbiome and your response to an immunotherapy. And while the mechanism is not, not understood, it's generally recognized that it's an immunomodulatory effect. You know, our, our, our guts are full of uh, um, immune cells. Our microbes are, are um, you know, interacting with those immune cells. And of course, immunotherapies by definition are, are uh, immunomodulators. Okay, so I'm going to be talking a lot about uh, human fecal material uh, poop in, in the coming slides, and I just want to clarify, in case it's not clear for anyone, the reason I'm doing so is because when we talk about the gut microbiome and we want to do measurements on your gut microbiome, the, mater the way we do that is collect your fecal material. You know, it's, it's not invasive. Everyone poops. Everyone, you know, sometimes most people poop multiple times a day. So uh, it's, an, it's a convenient media to use as a proxy for understanding what's going on in your gut. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, as I pointed out before, you know, in a, in a, in a gut uh, uh, fecal sample, you know, there's hundreds or thousands of species of bacteria and, and everyone is very different. And this brings me to fecal microbiome transplants. Uh, these have been in the news a lot. Uh, they, some people say they're new, but in fact, they go back to you know, ancient civilizations. Um, but um, you know, fecal microbiome transplants recently in the last 10 or 15 years have really come on the scene because of their demonstration of uh, really high efficacy at treating recurring and primary Clostridium difficile. You know, Clostridium difficile infections are a horrible disease that affect, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the U.S. every year, more around the world, and many young, healthy people die of C. diff every year. Uh, the standard of care used to be treatment with antibiotics, which is kind of counterintuitive if you think about what's happening with the gut microbiome. 
but now the standard of care is emerging as an FMT. So if you've got this nasty Clostridium difficile infection in your gut, uh, you repopulate it with a fresh microbiome that is, you know, fecal material, and it's highly efficacious. Uh, so it works well for uh, Clostridium difficile, and you know it's not a, a, a leap of faith to say, well, let's try it for other indications, other pathologies. And a quick search of clinicaltrials.gov this morning for fecal transplant revealed 555 studies, and they are all over the place in terms of um, uh, indications. So hematopoic stem cell uh, neoplasms, treatment of obesity, uh, treatment of irritable bowel disease and Clostridium difficile, of course, extreme drug resistant bacteria, uh, mental disorders like bipolar disorder and Tourette syndrome, uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, of course, there's a lot of uh, clinical trials ongoing to understand how gut microbiomes and FMTs uh, modulate the efficacy of immunotherapies that I mentioned before. And even, uh, you know, disorders like alcohol misuse and cirrhosis, you know, think about, you know, treating alcoholism with a uh, FMT. I'm not saying it works. I'm just saying that these are the, uh, you know, applications where, where things are being explored. In fact, many of these probably won't work. But it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's another uh, um, tool in our, our belt. So this was uh, big news uh, eight months ago, I guess, um, in November, of uh, six months ago. Uh, in November of 22, the FDA approved the first microbiome targeted therapeutic. It's, uh, it's known as Rebiota. Uh, as you can see in this bag, it is uh, a FMT-like material. There's still some confusion and some debate in the field as to whether this is an FMT or isn't an FMT. Uh, nevertheless, if you look at the label that you know this material comes in, it says Reb Yoda is manufactured from human fecal material, and Reb Yoda contains live microbes. So. Um, you know, it doesn't say on here necessarily that it is a lot, that it is a uh, fecal microbiome transplant. Uh, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> yes, uh, if you think about the manufacturing of this, uh, this is human, this is derived from human fecal material. So, you know, just as you might expect, they have screen donors that come into their facility every day and provide their bowel movement donations that are undergo some processing in their facilities. And it's, you know, some proprietary processing that produces this standardized output drug. Um, so thinking about quality control of, of biomanufacturing of either Reb Yoda or I've got FMT here. And again, you know, we're not uh, quite sure if Reb Yoda is an FMT or if it's something else, but, you know, what we need to know in order to produce this and use this, uh, you know, in a safe and effective way, uh, we need to understand what microorganisms are present in the material. That's, you know, these are, these are analytical measurements that are necessary. What are the relative quantities of the different microorganisms? Again, there may be hundreds of different species. So what are their relative abundances? Are, all the, are they all equally abundant? Probably not. Uh, does it matter that some are more abundant than others? Probably. Uh, are they viable? So some, some of these organisms are viable, some aren't, some die off, some are um, <clears throat> uh, anaerobic, that is that they die in the presence of oxygen. So um, are there any contaminants? That's an interesting question to think about. You know, there's hundreds of different species are in, in these products, but are there any organisms that aren't supposed to be there that might uh, constitute a safety issue or, you know, have an adverse event like a pathogen or some environmental isolate? Uh, how stable is this material? What's the shelf life, the viability? You know, do the, do the cells die off over time as you might expect they do? Um, how do you even measure potency? You know, any drug that's manufactured needs a, like an in vitro potency assay. What is potency for a therapeutic like this that we don't even understand the mechanism of action? Um, similarly, what's a dose? How do you define a dose? Is it a certain number of organisms? And, you know, going back to this human donor manufacturing process, it can't be 100% reproducible in terms of batch to batch reproducibility. So what is the variability of batch to batch reproducibility? Um, I, I mentioned this because I probably didn't point out enough, but NIST is a measurement science institute, a metrology institute. So we don't do clinical trials. We don't, we're not a public health agency. We focus on measurement science. So it's exactly these kinds of questions that we uh, geek out on and uh, we, we work on. 
And, you know, we work with biopharmaceutical companies a lot. Um, you know, this is how I, I got to know uh, Yvonne Navour, our next speaker, who, uh, who works on quality control and biomanufacturing of, of microbiome products. Um, so if, uh, you know, the way that Reb Yoda is used clinically, you know, if you have a cohort of patients with Clostridium difficile, and by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it, but Reb Yoda, it, you know, it is used to treat uh, recurring Clostridium difficile. So if you have, uh, you know, patients that have uh, Clostridium difficile, you know, you treat them with Reb Yoda, this, this live biotherapeutic product, and, you know, presumably it restores their healthy gut microbiome and it cures their, their disease. Uh, and, you know, presumably you'd want to analyze the patients before and after. And when I say analyze, you know, how does the therapy change the patient's gut microbiome? Uh, can the therapeutic microbes be detected in the gut? So, you know, if, I, if I'm a patient, I've got some, uh, you know, gut microbes of my own, and then you're going to introduce more via this uh, therapeutic modality. And, uh, you know, as a researcher, you might want to know, like, can I detect the therapeutic microbes over... Um, over the, uh, my normal, uh, um, normal gut flora. <clears throat> How it, it's interesting that, you know, the field has, has sort of um, merged on using the word engraftment. We hear that a lot with like tissue transplants, but, you know, it's, it's, it's not that different that you're, in, you're, you're, you're taking cell tissue material and putting from one patient to another. So you might ask how long or how stable are these therapeutic microbes in the gut? And, uh, you know, again, all these measurements are performed on fecal samples. So um, there's magic in poop. If I haven't already convinced you, uh, poop can be highly efficacious at treating disease. Um, <clears throat> however, we know that some poop works and some doesn't. So super poop, you know, these companies that, um, that prepare FMT materials, they have some screening where they find donors that have, you know, efficacious poop. Uh, sometimes they're called super poop tubes. Um, but we don't really know what the right poop looks like. That is, we can't measure one fecal sample and measure another one and say, this one is right and this one's wrong. We don't know. Uh, we don't know what the thing or things are that we can measure to determine if an FMT is efficacious or not, or if it will be efficacious. To make things, you know, a, a few orders of magnitude more complicated, you know, the gut microbiome has been described as the most complex ecosystem on earth. And remember, it is an ecosystem. You can't just add bugs willy nilly. These things have evolved to live together and work together. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to measure. Uh, the clinical applications of the human microbiome are therapeutics and diagnostics. And I'm going to talk quickly about microbiome diagnostics. And uh, I'm sure most of you on this call are familiar with the 23andMe model, where, you know, if you want to get your, your personal genome analyzed from 23andMe, you, you sign up on their website. Uh, you pay them to have a kit sent to your house. They send you a kit. You open the kit. You provide some saliva or uh, buccal swabs and send it back and they analyze it. And um, <clears throat> they send you a report about your, uh, your, your personal microbiome. That same model is being used for um, direct consumer gut microbiome testing. And uh, this is a uh, article that uh, really emphasizes some of the problems and challenges uh, around this. So this uh, science reporter, her name is uh, Tina uh, Hirschman. Um, she rec she wanted to look into this as a science reporter, and she identified two companies, American Gut and Ubiome, Ubiome that uh, offer these direct consumer testing. So she took one of her fecal samples and she split it in half, and she sent half to Ubiome and the other half to American Gut. And as she reports in her article, I asked two different companies to analyze my gut microbiome, and they gave nearly opposite results with respect to the major phyla bacteria in duplicate samples, that is, you know, one fecal sample. So at, being a science writer, she did her due diligence. She reached out to the companies and asked and told them, look, here's what I got, here's what I saw. And, and you know, they're contradictory. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, quotes here. So, you know, uh, one of the microbiome experts in the field commented that the lack of reproducibility between studies is frustrating. It seems like cowboy country, we need to have some kind of order. Um, you know, another blogger who's a bioinformatician, he asked her for the raw data, the raw sequence data that the company generated. He then analyzed that raw sequence data using his tools, and he got yet a third answer. 
So, um, <clears throat> but DNA extraction is not the only thing that could go wrong. It seems that every step in the process from how you collect the samples through the computer programs used to analyze the data is a potential culprit. All sorts of unlikely things are possible and finding which one is true is difficult. So these are very NISTI statements. You know, NIST is a measurement science institute. We think about bias, um, analytical performance of measurements and things like this. So uh, this is a, um, um, probably a nine-year-old article. Um, so uh, I can tell you though that, you know, the number of direct consumer microbiome testing companies has grown considerably since this article came out nine years ago. And I don't think the measurements have improved proportionally. So I'm going to talk about metagenomics 101. Uh, this is really the lifeblood of what we do in my group at NIST. It's a very powerful tool. Uh, so if you have a complex sample, um, like a fecal sample or a soil sample, where you have hundreds or thousands of different species of microbes all in one sample, and you want to know what are the organisms, who are they, and what are they doing in this sample? Uh, <clears throat> what you do in a metagenomic measurement is you just simply do a DNA extraction and remember all life on earth is nucleic acid based. So every organism on earth is going to have uh, either uh, a nucleic acid element to it, which we can use to identify them. So after you extract DNA, uh, you just simply put it on a sequencing instrument and you sequence all that DNA and you get a, you know, a GATC type of sequence output. And from that sequence data, we can identify based on the, you know, the genetic signatures of the microbes from reference databases that we know, we can go back and say, okay, now we know who's in the sample. We know what their relative abundance is. And this really wasn't available to us um, 20 years ago because DNA sequencing technology was a lot more cumbersome and it was expensive and it was low throughput. But now DNA sequencing technology has been democratized and you can do a microbial genome for like $5 now and you can do a human genome for like $500, it's crazy. Um, it's outpaced Moore's law. So that's just allowed us to really, you know, um, leverage and, and, and utilize next-gen sequencing technology for metagenomics. Uh, the previous slide I showed you was sort of the 101 metagenomics, but this is the more realistic measurement workflow. Um, I'll just point out, I like to think of uh, metagenomics as the 21st century microscope because uh, just like the microscope did in the 17th century, it allowed us to see things that we couldn't see before. And that's exactly what metagenomics does for us. We can see things now that we couldn't see before. Uh, instead of directly peering at them through a microscope, now we see their DNA signatures, which is just as good, almost as good. I don't know, maybe better. At any rate, in the workflow, you know, you've got your sample collection and storage. As I mentioned, you extract DNA, then you're going to have to do some molecular manipulations of that DNA to make it compatible with your sequencing instrument. Then you put it on your sequencing instrument, you generate the data, the data comes off, and you're going to do some filtering and trimming of that data. And then you have to do some statistical analysis and reporting. And, uh, you know, another way of showing this workflow is using these Ishikawa diagrams, or sometimes they're known as fishbone diagrams. But it's just a way of showing, you know, there's a multitude of methodological variables that go into this. For example, you know, DNA extraction, there, there's dozens, hundreds of different ways to extract DNA from a sample. None of them are 100% efficient across all cell types. And they'll all give you a subsampled representation of what your original sample was. Uh, you know, moving on to the next step, library preparation. There's dozens of ways to prepare a library for next-gen sequencing. They'll all have their internal strengths and weaknesses and biases. Uh, there's half a dozen sequencing technologies on the market that have their own strengths and weaknesses. And the point is, and this is, you know, a, a, a statement I make at least 15 times a day here at NIST, that there's bias in every step of the measurement work, uh, process from how you collect and store your sample to how you analyze your data and everything in between. So at NIST, uh, we are, let me see if I can get rid of that. Okay. Uh, NIST, is, as I mentioned, is the Metrology Institute. And one of the things that we're probably known most well for is our development of re reference materials. Um, <clears throat> so if you come into our headquarters building and walk through the lobby, there's a showcase. Uh, and you'll see this, uh, this display that displays some NIST reference materials that have been developed over the last 100 years. You can see that we have uh, standard reference cigarettes, we have standard reference peanut butter, here's a meat homogenate, uh, sulfur and diesel fuel oil. Over here we've got industrial sludge and domestic sludge, I don't really know the difference between them. Um, and then we've got Portland cement, 
I don't know what's special about Portland. Some of these might seem silly, like why do you need cigarettes or why do you need peanut butter? That's ridiculous. But I promise you, every one of these has a very important industrial application. On average, it takes NIST about five years to produce one of these reference materials and not just five years, but a team of P, a small team of PhDs about five years. So we don't commit to this lightly. We don't just like willy nilly go out and say, hey, let's make a peanut butter standard. Like there needs to be a really pressing industrial need for one of these materials before we'll commit to developing it. And this brings me to our next new NIST reference material, human fecal material. Uh, so this is something that my group started about four years ago. And as I said, it takes about five years to produce one of these materials. And we're about a year out from having this ready. Um, here is some of the manufacturing processes that uh, we use to make large quantities of homogenized fecal material. Uh, ninja blending is uh, you know, an integral part of this process. Um, you know, the material needs to be homogenized and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, human fecal material is inherently heterogeneous. So, um, so more on the manufacturing of this material, we decided early on that for this NIST standard, we wanted, pardon the pun, two flavors of fecal material. So uh, we rationalized that um, you know, diet had the biggest impact on your gut microbiome. So to have two different types of human fecal material, we decided we would collect from two different cohorts that differ based on those diets. And as you can see here, those two cohorts are omnivores and vegetarians. So we, we recruited these two cohorts. We asked them to provide bowel movement samples, um, you know, sometimes multiple bowel movements per donor. Uh, we pooled those bowel movements, you know, did the homogenization using the old ninja blenders. And then we produced uh, about 5,000 aliquots of each. And each of these has about a mil in it. And we've spent a couple of years understanding how to stabilize this material because this material not only needs to be homogenous, it needs to be stable. It's no good to us if we, if we manufacture it and put it in the freezer and next year it's completely different than it was this year. You know, the point of a reference material is that you can measure it today and you can measure it a year from now and you get the same answer. So uh, homogeneity and stability is really what it's all about when you're producing a reference material and we've uh, honed in on uh, storage of this material at minus 80. The only, the only additive here is pure water. We did play with some storage buffers and additives and adulterants and we found that they all had uh, limitations that were harmful to this material. So we decided just to go the neat route, neat being just water. <clears throat> so this is real, pure human fecal material diluted in water. Uh, I mentioned that human fecal material is the most complex. It's been described as the most complex material, biological material on Earth. I can't vouch that it is because I haven't sampled every biological material on Earth. Uh, but, you know, just some uh, supporting facts here behind that. Um, human fecal material has been observed to contain up to 10 to the 12th microbial cells per gram of material. That's the highest cellular density of any known ecosystem on earth. That is, you know, scouring the earth, we haven't found any other microbial ecosystems with a cellular density that high. So they're really packing the cells in there. Rule of thumb is that there's about 10 uh, viral particles per uh, microbe. So there's, uh, you know, an order of magnitude more viral particles per gram of fecal material. Uh, think about the small molecule metabolites here. I'm saying thousands, but it's probably more like thousands of thousands, millions. Other biomolecules, uh, proteins, uh, RNA, lipids, all of these are very relevant, important. Uh, human fecal material often contains human cells that slough off from your epithelial cell lining and your intestinal cell wall. Uh, <clears throat> you eat food that comes from plant and animals and you will find plant and animal DNA and materials in your fecal material. So that's a part of it. And the reason I point this out is because this goes back to, you know, what I mentioned about how there's super poop and some poop is efficacious, some isn't. We don't know the thing yet that makes some poop efficacious and some isn't, but whatever it is, it's something in this list. Uh, and it's challenging to measure these things. Um, so every one of these things is a potential biomarker with clinical relevance. 
So, you know, going back to our fecal standard, you know, we've produced thousands of aliquots of a homogenized fecal material. And now what we're doing is multi-omic analysis. So metagenomic analysis that I mentioned, of course, that tells us the microbial taxa that are present and their relative abundance, but also a flow cytometry, a cell measurement techniques that shows us the cellular morphologies of the different types of cells present. Uh, good old fashioned Petri dish plating that shows us the, you know, the different morphologies of the different types of cells that are present. Metabolomic analysis, mass spec based metabolomic analysis shows us the small molecule metabolites present. We can also do metabolomics and we do do metabolomics using NMR based techniques uh, with some of the data shown here. Um, meta transcriptomics or gene expression. So, you know, those cells that are in this fecal material have, you know, some expression profile and we can measure what that gene expression profile is using meta transcriptomics. Uh, virome, I mentioned there's about 10 viral particles per microbial cell on average, and we can measure those viral materials. Uh, lipidomics are very important biomolecules that have uh, clinical implications and metaproteomics as well. So when I say multi-omic analyses, this is what I mean. We're throwing the kitchen sink at this stuff, measuring every uh, relevant uh, marker that we can uh, do. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that this is, um, <clears throat> uh, it's in the works. We've been working on it for about four years and we expect availability late 2023. And uh, I feel safe saying that this will be the most well-characterized human fecal standard on earth. Let me close that real quick. So. Okay. Um, so I'm going to shift gears real quick. I'm also noticing my time. And... Um, I'm going to talk about probiotics uh, because if you all are clinicians or you know involved in uh, human health and microbiome, this is a hot topic. So probiotics really come in two flavors. You can buy these, you know, like CVS, the pharma companies over the counter, over the shelf. Uh, yeah, these are like purified bacterial strains that come in capsules, and you know you take it like a vitamin or a pill. And then you know the old school probiotics, where where these derive from are fermented foods. So kimchi and yogurts and cabbage and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, on and on. So probiotics are not drugs. And I mean that in a regulatory sense. So the FDA has very clear guidance on what constitutes a drug and what doesn't constitute a drug. So probiotics, of course, contain live microbes, but uh, these are dietary supplements, according to the FDA. Uh, as dietary supplements, they're regulated by the Center for Food Safety, and the, you know, the Center for Food Safety regulates them using a framework like that of vitamins. So think of you know, the regulation of vitamin C or something like that, and that's how the FDA considers that. Since these are not drugs, the manufacturers cannot make medical claims, even if there's clinical trial data that have demonstrated efficacy, you still can't make medical claims. Um, so they make generic claims like friendly bacteria for your digestive system. That's what this one says. Okay, so uh, back to the old clinicaltrials.gov. I did a search for probiotics, 2,124 studies uh, using probiotics. And as you can see, they're all over the place. Here's one for HPV, um, exercise performance, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, on and on. So... One of the questions that I get, and um, it's it's uh, worth mentioning, do probiotics really work? And and uh, you know there are many many clinical trials that have been performed in an attempt to demonstrate the efficacy of probiotics for treating myriad diseases. When I say myriad diseases, I mean all of these different types of things you see here. And you know this question, do probiotics really work? It's such a generic question. Work for what? What probiotic? You know, there's there's uh, um, Many, many different types of probiotics, many different disease indications. Here's a uh, 2018 uh, systematic review and meta-analysis where they looked at, you know, a couple of do dozen clinical studies that looked at different indications. So I apologize for the resolution of this, but this one on top is pediatric uh, antibiotic-associated diarrhea. Here is adult antibiotic-associated diarrhea, Crohn's disease, Clostridium difficile infection, uh, nosocomial infections, traveler's diarrhea, 
And you can see what they're showing here is whether or not there was a, a, you know, a positive outcome. Was the probiotic, did it appear to be efficacious in these different clinical studies? And in some case, there appeared to be some efficacy. In some case, there wasn't. And uh, I stole these a couple of slides from a colleague, and I just want to show you some of these data. Sometimes, you know, even though st statistics says it's significant, it's still a little hard to see. So here's, uh, you know, using a probiotic lactobacillus GG for traveler's diarrhea. And, uh, you know, here they're saying that, uh, you know, the occurrence of uh, traveler's diarrhea was about 5% in kids who received the probiotic and 8% in kids that didn't. And they say that's statistically significant. I'll leave it up to you whether you think that's significant. Uh, here's a similar study where they looked at, uh, you know, the probiotic lactobacillus ruteri in acute diarrhea in children. Uh, the placebo is in blue, the, uh, the probiotic is in yellow, and again, you know, it, you kind of squint and look sideways, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, that seems to work. Um, <clears throat> and in some of these, you know, I just highlight in yellow at the very bottom, uh, you know, they just point out, hey, these differences were not statistically significant, and there's no benefit of probiotics. So back to that question, do probiotics work? Sometimes. It depends on the probiotic. It depends on, uh, you know, the indication, how they're treated. Uh, I just want to call out quickly uh, Dr. Dan Marenstein. Um, I don't know Dan personally, but I've heard him speak at a few conferences and I've read his papers. He's uh, um, a pediatrician at Georgetown University, right down the street, of course. And he does a lot of clinical studies using probiotics, namely to treat antibiotic associated diarrhea in children. And, um, and he's had a lot of success doing that. So I just want to point that out. If you're a clinician and you're thinking about probiotics for your patient, reach out to Dan. I'm sure he'd be happy to chat with you, or maybe not. As I said, I don't know Dan. But he's doing a lot of really great work, and he's, he's, uh, he's a recognized expert and leader in this field. Uh, many clinical studies uh, fail or are not reproducible because of the poor quality of manufactured probiotics. So this is the dirty underbelly of the world of probiotics, and that is manufacturing quality. I'm sure Yvonne will speak uh, more eloquently on this. But uh, specifically, if you're taking a probiotic and it says something on the, the label on the side of the bottle, uh, you know, is what is written on the side of the bottle on the label, is it, is it, what it, they say it is. Is it the right strain of bacteria genetically? Um, and I can tell you from some personal experience in sequencing some uh, probiotics that we bought off the shelf at drugstores, uh, sometimes they're not. Purity. Uh, are there any other organisms in there or con chemical contaminants that shouldn't be in there? Um, are they alive? You know, presumably these bugs need to be alive to be eff efficacious, but during the manufacturing processes, they undergo these mechanically uh, uh, harmful processes like lyophilization and spray drying that can kill the bacteria. So, you know, uh, how effective are they if they're all dead by the time you get them manufactured? Uh, what is a dose? Uh, you know, they are uh, typically on the side of a, a probiotic bottle, you might see 10 to the nine uh, live cultures or something like that. You know, we've looked at that in our labs and sometimes, you know, they say it's 10 to the nine, but we get 10 to the five. You know, they're off by four orders of magnitude. Stability, the shelf life, how long do they stay alive? Uh, and batch to batch reproducibility. You know, again, if, if you're doing a clinical trial from a batch of probiotic produced today, and then you want to repeat it tomorrow, and the batch that you use tomorrow is, is produced differently, you're going to get a different clinical outcome. Uh, <clears throat> I'm part of a USP probiotics panel that formed about five or six years ago, and it was specifically formed to address this, uh, this problem in the industry that is around quality of probiotics. So what this USP probiotics expert panel is doing is developing quality standards for the probiotic industry. And, you know, a lot of times you see third party validations and, you know, the drugstores and the vitamin aisle. And, and one of those is USP. It's got the USP seal and USP is a, you know, a, a third party independent uh, certification and quality uh, assurance um, <clears throat> agency. So, you know, in the not too distant future, hopefully you'll start seeing probiotics on the shelf that have the USP seal of approval. Uh, this USP panel, we've developed a new USP general chapter that is for manufacturers to follow this protocol and how to do it right. Um, 
<clears throat> we've published in peer reviewed journals uh, about improving end user trust in the quality of commercial probiotics. Uh, here we discuss, you know, third party certifications, uh, setting standards for identity, purity, and quantification of probiotics. Uh, we talk about some emerging methodologies, namely metagenomics, that can be used to assess quality. I uh, see I've, uh, I'm at 43 minutes and I was told to go for 45, so I'm going to finish up after uh, this slide. So some take home messages, some take home message for clinicians around probiotics. Uh, read the literature. Um, you know, the, the average consumer, non scientist can only read the bottle and the bottle is going to say improves gut health. They're probably not going to have the wherewithal to go to PubMed, find the you know peer-reviewed literature, and read about how that probiotic strain was studied clinically and whether it was efficacious or not. Uh, but you, as a clinician, as a scientist, you can do that. So ask you know in the literature, has a rigorous clinical study been performed? Did they use the gold standard randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial? And pr preferably, this trial was not done by the manufacturer because, well, I don't need to say why, but uh, preferably, uh, it was done by an independent party like an academic. There are thousands of different probiotic products on the market, like different strains. They're all different genetically. You know, Lactobacillus acidophilus is a typical species of probiotic, but there are, you know, uh, innumerable different strains that are genetically different and therefore metabolically different and unique, and presumably they will all have different clinical outcomes. Um, and to complicate that, you know, some of the probiotics are blends of multiple or many strains. Uh, you know, because I'm in this field, when I go to CVS, I go to the probiotic aisle and I just start reading labels just out of curiosity. And some of these probiotics now will have 10 or 15 different strains of bacteria in them. So, um, you know, is more better? I don't, I don't think there's any clinical evidence to say more is better. Also think about, you know, fermented foods like yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut that contain probiotics. You know, people say I take probiotics. That could mean that I eat yogurt every day and that's, that's legit. Um, but, you know, if you see some clinical outcome, uh, is, it, is it due to the, the microbes or is it just, uh, you know, due to the food? You know, you're increasing fiber consumption, et cetera, if you're eating kimchi. Uh, you know, maybe the clinical improvement you see is just because you're, uh, you know, consuming larger amounts of high fiber food. Uh, partner with reputable companies if you want to do a uh, clinical trial, uh, you know, a reputable probiotic manufacturer. Uh, and also, once you receive the product in-house, again, let's say you're going to do a clinical trial, you get all your probiotic material in-house, do an independent confirmation in-house to make sure that what you have is what's written on the label. Like you can sequence the genome of the bacteria and do some PCR and various things like that. <clears throat> because again, there's no guarantee that what the manufacturer gives you is what's on the label. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, uh, that's all I have. I just want to mention that NIST has uh, very uh, competitive and prestigious postdoctoral fellowship opportunities. They're run by the NRC for us. Uh, they're relatively high paying. That is that the uh, postdoctoral fellows get paid 77,000 per year about, I think it might even be a little bit higher than that now for two years. Compare that to the NIH average right now that I think is about 55K. Uh, it also comes with a travel allowance, and uh, our NRC postdoctoral fellows go on to do great things like win Nobel Prizes, literally, and uh, become the NIST director. This is the uh, incredibly talented and wonderful team that I've had the uh, pleasure of working with, a very uh, technically diverse group of people, analytical chemists, biomedical engineers, chemical engineers, microbiologists, etc. cetera. Uh, it takes a village. And that's uh, all I have. And I think we're saving questions to the end. Correct. We can uh, move on to this next speaker introduction, which you are doing. So Scott, you will keep the microphone. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I made a slide. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Yvonne Nivor. Uh, I've known Yvonne for a few years through uh, microbiome industry meetings. So uh, Yvonne is at uh, uh, Boston Analytical in Boston. Uh, she's been there for a few years where uh, she works in the microbiology department as a principal scientist for microbiome. Uh, Yvonne works with the business development and client services within uh, Boston Analytical, Analytical, so sort of collaborates across the company. Uh, and uh, I'm sure she'll tell you more about what Boston Analytical does, but a really innovative and great company. 
uh, Yvonne's PhD is in neuroscience from the University of Idaho, and she also has a bachelor's in biology from the uh, Kwame University of Science and Technology in Ghana. Uh, and her PhD and postdoctoral work focused on how the gut microbiome impacts human health. And uh, on a personal note, Dr. Uh, Nyavor uh, enjoys collecting house plants, cooking, listening to good music, reading, engaging in various community initiatives, spending time with her husband, friends, and traveling. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Yvonne. Wow, thank you for talking me up, Scott. <laughs> and great presentation. That is going to be a really tough presentation to follow, but I'm going to do my best to, to not disappoint <laughs> Scott and everyone else listening. And so um, one second while I share my screen, I'm just pulling up my presentation. Looks good. Looks good. You can see the slide. I'm hoping nothing gets cut off. So I'm just um, gonna try and make sure it's it's perfect before I, I even begin. Ooh. Okay, drawing is not my strong suit. I'm having to draw. Okay, all right. So hi, um, as, as Scott mentioned, my name is uh, Yvonne. I work at Boston Analytical as a principal scientist. Uh, I oversee a lot of the microbiome specific projects that come to Boston Analytical. So what is Boston Analytical? Um, we're a very strong science-based uh, quality, basically quality partner company. We help provide a lot of the downstream testing and prioritization that drug manufacturers need to release products and to basically go into clinical trials or to sell products on the market. Um, basically, you know, we're, we're basically the people who help to ensure that the products and the drugs that are released are safe and efficacious. And uh, a few years ago, the company um, invested quite heavily in microbiome-based therapeutics, specifically because this field is growing quite rapidly. Um, this is probably the extent of the industry stuff I'll bring to this talk. Um, just because I thought I'd go in a slightly different direction this time. So for, for today's talk, I will be focusing on the development of the gut microbiome and the long-term health outcomes, just drawing on a lot of the great research that um, people are doing. Just as Scott just mentioned, um, you know, a lot of the people in the audience, your clinicians or uh, people who, who are very interested in healthcare, work in healthcare, there's literally thousands of papers available on the subject. So I'm hoping to provide kind of a, a, a you know, small summary or, or a small discussion on some of the salience literature related to the development of the gut microbiome and how that impacts uh, long-term health outcomes um, across the board. And then I'm, all, I'm, I'm basically gonna start off talking about a brief recap of microbiome function um, so this is going to be a little bit basic for some people in the audience, while for others, it might provide some new detail. I will um, talk a little bit about determinants of microbiome structure. Um, Dr. Jackson has started us off really well talking about, you know, diet, for example. So I will continue that conversation. And then I will start talking about the development of a microbiome in utero all the way to adulthood. Um, again, this is going to be a very, very big picture conversation. So Definitely not a full um, class or lecture, and I'm gonna try to keep it simple and easy to understand. And then I will jump um, briefly onto microbiome and long-term health outcomes with a very short conversation around how microbiome can contribute to personalized, personalized health outcomes and reduction of healthcare disparities, um, because it, it's, it's a subject that uh, personally I'm very passionate about, and I, I've, I've had mentors who are very passionate about this as well, had really great engaging conversations around. So. I thought this might be a great place. Uh, George Washington is a very diverse university, so I, I thought it'd be a really great uh, place to start having this conversation in the field. So let's jump in. Ooh, uh, there's a huge amount of, of, of interest in the gut microbiome, right? Um, Scott already shared and the opening remarks showed you there's literally thousands of publications around this. And, and when you move away from the you know, literature, scientific literature, and even look uh, general publications, magazines, we're seeing people, even the magazines like The Economist talking about the importance of the gut microbiome. So there's a huge emphasis on it, but why? The, the big question is, is really why the sudden, not, not really sudden, but it feels sudden for someone that's been doing this over 10 years. It feels sudden that 
um, you know, there's so much interest from the public on this. And so really, I think the reason for this is because there's now increased awareness and, and easy, easily available information on how important the gut microbiome is. So this is just a recap from Scott's talk. We know the gut microbiome is the resident community of microbes in the gut. So there's fungi, there's bacteria, there's viruses, there's protists. And then we also know that the gut microbiome is an essential part of our bodies. It, it plays a really vital role in the health and maintenance of homeostasis. So this is a really great summary um, that shows you all of the different parts of our health that are touched by the microbiome, right? Even on things um, like you might think about modulation of bone mass density, like how does the microbiome contribute to that? But when you look at the actual um, way that bone density um, is determined and you look at the pathway, the involvement of the immune system, and we know that the microbiome plays a huge role in um, the, the, the setting up the formation of the immune system, training it, and then actually even um, the development of it and its full healthy function, then we can understand why the microbiome plays such an essential role in all of these things. So the microbiome protects against epithelial injury, it helps in the promotion of fat storage, it helps in the promotion of angiogenesis, and obviously GI um, motility and sensation, um, which I spent a lot of my PhD studying. The microbiome plays a very essential role here. Um, it helps develop and train the immune system, just as I, I mentioned earlier. And the microbiome is one of our most important partners in the biosynthesis of vitamins and amino acids. Without the microbiome, um, vital um, vitamins like vitamin K would not be made, right? And then drug metabolism, we're learning more and more that there are certain drugs that require the presence of a certain profile of microbiome to work, right? And just as Scott mentioned, please bear in mind, it's not necessarily a good or a bad microbiome. It's just we're learning that there's certain types of microbiomes that work a certain way, right? And we'll get into that a little bit more later. And then the development of modification of the nervous system is one of the, has been one of the largest areas I've spent most of my career studying how the microbiome contributes to this. Without microbiome signals, we actually wouldn't have a healthy nervous system developed across the, with the brain and the gut itself. And I'll talk more a little bit about this later on. And then helping to break down food compounds. This is one of the most important factions of the, of the gut microbiome. And we've learned a lot of this from both human work, but largely using rodent models. And it's been super helpful to have animal models for basic scientists to be able to study this. So here are some of the key bacteria that we, um, and their functions, right? I just wanted to put the slide up because I thought it was a great summary of, of some of the really essential compounds we need um, in our bodies for healthy physiology and function that a gut microbiome produces. And so we can talk about something like a uh, bowel salt hydro hydrolase, um, which is actually produced by bifidobacteria and bacteroidae species. And so you can start thinking about if um, a, 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 an individual has a profile in their gut microbiome that is lacking in certain species of bacteroides or bifido that are required to um, produce this BSH and break down bowel salts pretty much then you start getting into, right? Is that you can see the downstream health impacts on that individual. And even along um, things like lipid and glucose metabolism, secondary bowel acids play a huge important role in that. And so again, using that example earlier where an individual could have, um, you know, a missing bifido species that makes BSH, you suddenly have more secondary bowel acids, which can, which can actually affect the person's lipid and glucose metabolism. And a lot of these pathways are involved in, um, you know, general important metabolic function. So immune hemostasis and inflammation, energy harvest and fat storage, satiety control, making sure that we're not overeating. Um, so it's extremely important, right? The, the gut microbiome is important. So this is why we're paying so much attention to it. So going back to the basic science uh, part of this, these are some of the most important metabolites that we found. Um, looking, doing, doing a really quick review of literature, these are the, some of the most important um, metabolites that a microbiome makes that contribute to health. So we have folate, 
which you know can be surprising to a lot of people to find out that microbiome makes folate. We have indoles, we have secondary bile acids, we have TMAO, which plays a huge role, um, not just in metabolic function, but actually when you go into neuroscience, TMAO is a very, very well characterized. And, and we study this quite a bit in, in, in healthy nervous um, system function. Short chain fatty acids receive a lot of attention. Uh, so butyrate, propionate, acetate, these are made primarily by microbiota. So if, if you don't have a healthy, well, I shouldn't say healthy, um, a certain profile of, of microbiome can, can basically determine the amount of each of these that you make, which in the end also determine, for example, how your gut functions, because we know that uh, colonic cells, for example, use butyrate and acetate as uh, fuel to function. So if we have less of these short-chain fatty acids, you can begin to see, again, it's a cascade, right? So we, we certainly recognize that we need a, a certain type of profile of microbiome in order to produce these short-chain fatty acids, which are extremely crucial to health. And apart from that, we can actually then capitalize on, on knowing what these short-chain fatty acids do and learn how to make more of them in our bodies. And then um, as a neuroscientist, I geek out over this. Uh, I geeked out over this when I found out that, uh, you know, we, we actually have bugs or bacteria in our guts that make neurotransmitters. And so GABA and serotonin are the most, uh, most studied ones that are made by bacteria in the gut. And what we have learned, for example, with serotonin is that a large amount of the serotonin that is needed for healthy function that is used throughout you know, the body, especially in the brain, is actually made in the gut. And so essentially the gut microbiome is one of our biggest partners here. Without the gut microbiome, without a healthy profile of these organisms in our guts, we're, we're even affecting things like brain function, right? So this is, anyway, I geek out over that all the time. All right, so this is a very busy slide. I apologize. I will not um, try <laughs> to make you understand all of it, right? But this provides basically just an overview of all of the ways that these previously discussed uh, or listed metabolites I talked about basically regularly post-metabolism. And the reason I, I wanted to, to, to bring this up is because regulation of post-metabolism is one of the biggest underlying um, ways that affect our long-term health, right? So really understanding how the gut microbiome is doing this has been the focus of a lot of basic science researchers for, for decades now. And what we have learned is that there are multiple pathways of course, right? There's so many metabolites. So of course there are multiple pathways, but the gut microbiome affects uh, our host metabolism. So I will just point out, for example, the TMAO that I mentioned earlier. TMAO is uh, basically um, involved in the atherosclerosis pathogenesis, right? And so you can see that TMAO actually is related to, it's produced by specific bacteria in the lumen of the gut. And I wish I could use a pointer. Oh yeah, there is a pointer. Perfect. So we have specific bacteria that are able to um, convert L-carnitine and phosphatidylcholine to TMAO, right? And this contributes directly to atherosclerosis uh, pathogenesis, right? So that's one pathway and we can see the myriad of them. There are so many of them that affect things like body weight gain and fat mass. And satiety has a couple of different pathways that I won't talk about today because this is an obesity or nutritional health uh, webinar, but um, it's, it's something I spent a bit of time studying. It's a very fascinating pathway worth um, studying. So, what is in the gut? I've talked a lot about the bacteria. So that's no surprise that a lot of what we have in our gut is bacteria. And so when we look at the gastrointestinal tract from the stomach all the way to the colon, and we start to basically just count how much bacteria do we have in each of these, 
we start to see an increasing gradient as we go from the stomach to the colon. So stomach has like 10 to the one bacteria. By the time you get to the colon, you're at 10 to the 12. And the reason for this is because the stomach has pretty tough conditions for bugs to survive in. There's all of that acid. There's, there's a ton of stuff going on in the stomach that bugs don't necessarily like. So there is some resistant organisms that are able to live there, but the large majority of them are in the colon where most of the fermentation of food happens. And so this is why, just as Scott mentioned earlier, when we take fecal material, poop, we end up measuring this 10 to the 12. It's largely because fermentation is occurring in the colon. And so they're happy there. They're able to grow quite a bit. All right. But it's not just bacteria. Fungi play a huge role in the microbiome. And this is beginning to emerge as one of the areas of a microbiome um, study. It's called microbiome um, on its own because a lot of the papers, a lot of those thousands of papers referenced focus on the, on the bacteria in the gut. But there it really is a huge population of fungi as well. It's not that big or well characterized. And the part of that is you know, technological limitations and method development needed and all of that. However, we know they're there and they actually interact with the uh, bacteria that live in the gut to perform some of the essential functions that are needed and are involved in multiple pathways. And so um, we can take something like candida species, right? Um, when, when, when we have an impaired microbiome, a lot of the time what we see is an increase in candida, speech, candida species. When we have a well-balanced, in quotes, and I, I use quotes, and I'll, I'll explain why later. Uh, when we have a well-balanced bacterial microbiome, we have fewer candida. And a lot of the time we've realized that increased candida is actually um, associated with diseases like type 2 diabetes and obesity. And a part of that is because of this downstream um, immune pathway that happens that we don't want, right? So it sets, it basically sets up inflammation, which isn't good for the body long term. So actually really important to note, re the takeaway from this is that indirect interactions between gut fungi and bacteria, they actually affect our host immunity by changing the cytokine profile to a more inflammatory state, which can contribute to diseases. All right, so what affects the composition of the gut microbiota? Diet and lifestyle are the biggest drivers. This is why it's, it's bolded up here. Um, and Scott mentioned diet quite a bit, talked about how that, you know, he, he they, they based the selection of the donors on diets. And so they have the omnivore and a vegetarian, and that's how they collected the stool for the standard. Um, this is because again, diets is probably one of the largest drivers of the gut microbiome. And you might, you can, you can see why, right? We have so many different things in food that can inform what is in the gut. But there are also other factors. There's host specific factors, such as genetic factors, um, there's age, there's over, the overall health status of the host. And so, you know, different diseases can affect the microbiome. And then there's consumption of drugs, including antibiotics. So these are the largest drivers of the gut microbiome. Here, I'm just showing how diet affects the gut microbiome over time. The largest takeaway from the slide is that as we go from being a baby to an adult, where the diversity of our food is changing, right? So when you're a baby, you're only taking like breast milk or formula or both. Um, you're, you're really limited in the amount of uh, food you're, or different types of food you're taking. You have a very small, low diversity of microbiota down here. So you can see that the different colors, there's fewer. Then in the background here, as diet diversity goes up and the diet diversity is the upper panel, as that goes up, you begin to see that there is an increase in the diversity of different microorganisms that is that are inhabiting your your, your gut. So this th these types of studies are some of the um, biggest. Um, they they basically give us the most information around how diet affects the microbiome. Helps us to see that really changing the diversity of your diet is what is impacting your microbiome long term. So here is also a really cool summary um, that I found from, from a paper. And here um, it's just showing 
that if you take a diet high in um, animal fat on the right, so a diet high in animal fat and protein on the right, but low in plant fiber. Uh, so this is uh, what we call a typical Western diet in those of us who study uh, type two diabetes and obesity. And you compare that to people or you basically a gut microbiome of an individual that takes a diet low in animal fat and protein, but high in plant fibers. Um, we see things like the metabolic process of each of them is different. Um, for example, the person taking the Western diet, which is high in fat, is, is gonna have an aberrant microbiota, which we find typically associated with metabolic diseases like type two diabetes and obesity. And this is typically present even when the person doesn't have any of those conditions. It's largely because of the diets that they're eating. And then you begin to see the downstream effects of that. We see the impact on the lumen, for example. Um, we see um, impaired barrier function, which is commonly referred to as leaky gut, um, allowing certain things in the gut to get out and set up systemic inflammation, which just low grade systemic inflammation by itself can go back into the cycle and end up um, creating uh, downstream effects later on in life. And then antibiotics, I mean, this is probably predictable to a lot of the people watching this, right? It's antibiotics, they're set up to kill bacteria, right? Um, so what ends up happening though with antibiotic consumption is that it affects the overall stability or homeostasis of the gut microbiome. And so say you have one infection, you know exactly what bug you're trying to eradicate and you take antibiotics. Um, you aren't just eradicating that one bug. There's what we call collateral damage. And so here we start antibiotic treatments. This is a line to show, and these blue dots basically show the number of bacteria present in that individual. So before antibiotic consumption, you can see that's pretty high number of bacteria. And then they take antibiotics, you can see that rapid drop in a bacterial number. And this is after antibiotic treatment stops, we still have a low number of bacteria. It takes a really long time for that number to recover. So the take home message here is that it takes a while to recover from antibiotic treatment. As, um, and so one of the largest things we need to be aware of is when we are prescribing antibiotics as clinicians or we're consuming them, just engaging in that conversation with patients or with our healthcare pr practitioners to try to mitigate some of that damage after taking the antibiotics because we need antibiotics to survive. We can't, we can't live without them but we can try to mitigate some of that damage by making sure we're pres prescribing more specific antibiotics to treat exactly what we have. And number two, having a discussion with our medical practitioners to, to work out a plan for making sure we restore some of this balance early. All right, so um, now I'm gonna basically just start talking about how we get a microbiome in the first place. And I'm gonna try to speed through this, this part pretty fast. We know that age affects the, micro, the microbiome structure. The, the way we know this is by doing longitudinal studies. So we take people and study them for years, or we take samples from a homogeneous population of people where there are different age groups represented. And so this is, this is from a review paper that summarized some of that. Um, what we see is that there is a change in the relative abundance of different types of bacteria in the gut of individuals based on their age. And so when we have a preterm infant at birth and discharge, they have, for example, fairly low amounts of bacteroidetes. And then over time, you can see as they grow, that's the yellow line, they're having more bacteroidetes. So we know age affects the microbiome, but how do we get a microbiome in the first place? Where does it actually come from? We actually get our microbiomes from our mothers. So during pregnancy, there is a hypothesis that the womb is not sterile. So some bacterial interactions may happen with amniotic fluids. This is still really early stage. So this is not represented on the slide, um, but starting right at birth, depending on the mode of delivery, we start to see different types of bacteria that are colonizing the guts of children. So this gives us a really good indication then that we get most of our bacteria from our moms. I will just show this real quick. The part to focus on is this 
lower graph right here to again just confirm that we get most of our bugs from our moms when we look at a newborn when when you're born and you you basically have very low bacterial diversity as time goes on and by one year old your bacterial your microbiome is expected to resemble a more mature microbiome by one year old most babies' microbiomes will begin to look almost exactly or identical to their mothers. And this is largely dictated, dictated by a whole bunch of different things, including breast milk. So if a child is breastfed, for example, there is some evidence that um, bacteria can be transferred from breast milk to babies. There's also the del delivery route. We already talked about that. So for example, babies delivered through C-sections have bacteria that are more um, representative of the skin than you know, babies that are born vaginally. Those have bacteria representative of the gut. So basically based on mode of delivery. And then a lot of the time we're beginning to learn that um, the health status of the mom can affect the baby's microbiome as well. We'll talk a little bit about that later. So many factors can really affect the colonization of a baby from birth. There are prenatal factors, there's neonatal factors, and then there's postnatal factors. So after a child is born, most of the time, the postnatal factors are the ones that come into play. And as we might imagine, diet becomes important. And so for a baby that's breast milk versus formula, the geographical location, the family members, the interactions of a baby with a community. So is that baby being passed around or is the baby mostly isolated and with just their mom and their dad? Um, maternal diets plays a huge role because, you know, again, we're passing some of that from the mom to the baby and then the weaning, what they eat actually after you wean them off. Um, so this shows a window of opportunity for microbiota modulation in children. Um, for those interested in pediatric modulation, Typically, as the child gets older, we lose that window of opportunity. So we want to do it earlier, probably right after birth. All right. And here is a very busy <laughs> chart. Again, you don't have to look at all the details. This is just to point out that the delivery mode affects the transfer of these microbes from mom to baby. So these are vaginally born babies up here. These are vaginally um, C-section delivered babies down here. And the big take home here is that the vaginally born babies typically have similar species of organisms, the same levels of these of bacterial species as their mothers than the C-section babies. So C-section babies tend to have different levels of, of the same organisms um, and, and each of these represent a time point. So the C-section babies, it takes them about a year to get to the mom's level. For vaginally delivered babies, a lot of them resemble their moms right off the bat. Okay, so nutrition. Undernutrition was a big focus of study for a while. And the reason for this is because undernutrition plays a role in the formation of the microbiome. And so um, there are multiple um, studies that have demonstrated that the first 1000 days of life is the most critical period for making sure that we establish a healthy gut microbiome. And actually um, it helps to determine the health status of the individual later in life. So what we're showing here on this graph is just some of the key bacterial taxa that affect the, the child at different time points that play you know, roles at different time points and different um, developmental milestones and the first 1000 days of life. And so just going all the way to like weaning after day 450, this is the list of organisms that we hypothesize are important to have at this stage because they affect nutrition and hygiene. And then, um, so you can then also see the organisms that are associated with poor nutrition, undernutrition, and poor hygiene and things like that. Okay, so there is a hypothesis called develop the developmental origins of health and disease. This basically posits that there are critical periods in um, fetal and early development in, in a child's environment which affects a child's metabolism, neurogenesis, and basically just long-term health outcomes. And we're beginning to realize in the microbiome field that you know, the risk of chronic disease can actually be associated with the type of microbiome that babies start out 
with, right? So there's a lot of companies who are beginning to study this a lot, trying to figure out if there's a way to modulate the microbiome of babies right off the bat right here when there is a reduced risk of chronic disease before later in life, they start to have that higher risk here. Okay, so here are the important factors by critical periods in a child's life. During pregnancy, the maternal health status is probably the largest um, contributor along with uh, the vaginal health of the mom. And then after uh, pregnancy, you know, de delivery, the mode of the delivery and the gestational period along with hospital environment play the largest roles. Then during infancy, that's when actually host genetics kicks in. So it's pretty cool to see that most of the things before infancy are environmental and based on the maternal health status. So many things determine long-term health. We've got genetics, diet, mode of delivery, we just talked about that, environment, drugs, exercise. There's so many things that impact health. So we're just gonna talk briefly about some of them. So um, the gut microbiome early in life, I just mentioned, can predispose individuals to illness later on. So this is a summary from a review article that demonstrates that um, there are dysbiotic communities, or when we use the term dysbiosis, we're referring, referring to an unbalanced community of microorganisms present in babies that can determine if they're gonna get certain diseases later on. And this has been linked to things like neurological disorders, um, allergies, cardiovascular diseases. Cardiovascular disease is probably the largest studied areas out of these. I'm gonna skip that because I don't wanna spend too much time on it. So what are the maternal factors that actually affect a baby early in life that can determine their long-term health aspects? One of the largest is the mother's weight. The second is diet. Third, consumption of the, you know, drug intake, and then the environment they live in. So there are things that are not within mother's controls, and then there are things that, that can potentially be mitigated. But a lot of the time, these things are not within the baby's control, right? Because get, it can affect the baby from the mother, so they, they can't control any of these. But what we know is that all of these can lead to a dysbiotic gut microbiome in the mom, which can then get transferred to the child. And this can actually affect fetal brain structure and function. And so we can start to see things like, again, increased uh, metabolic stress, increased hyperlipidemia, increased fatty acids, all of those things. These can actually affect the development, the healthy development of a baby. All right. So when we have, a, I mentioned um, weight plays a role here, the weight of the mom. The overweight or obese mothers have a dysbiotic gut. And a lot of the time, not all of them, obviously, but most of them do. And what we have found is that there is um, leaky gut, which I talked about earlier, just impaired barrier function. This can actually allow the, vert, the transmission of uh, bacteria that are obesogenic to a baby. Right. And this can then lead to an altered gut microbiome and immunity, which unfortunately can lead to a higher risk of childhood, overweight and obesity. And the mechanism by which this happens is typically through um, LPS and then um, production of an impaired profile of short-chain fatty acids. All right. This has also been seen in NAFLD, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We see that when we have maternal obesity, being one of the factors, along with uh, mode of delivery, antibiotic exposure, or breast milk exposure, we can actually build a model that can predict for the development of NAFLD in a, or NASH in a, in a child later in life or not. And a lot of it is largely, again, due to increased gut permeability, which leads to um, inflammation downstream. All right. Okay, so I've talked about impaired barrier function, but I just wanted to show uh, a brief uh, graphic of this. When we say impaired barrier, barrier function, what we are referring to is that these epithelial cells in the gut actually have really tight junctions. They typically don't allow just anything to get in and out of the gut. And so this, if this is inside the gut and this is outside the gut, stuff that stays here, it, it's only a selected few can make it through this barrier and get in, in a healthy individual or a non-dysbiotic individual. 
but we do have a conditions where um, because of an impaired gut microbiome or microbiome that um, just um, is dysbiotic or unbalanced, we then begin to see this barrier unfortunately become less tight, which then allows stuff to leak out of the gut. And this is what we call leaky gut and then cause systemic inflammation. All right. So how can we benefit from all of this information I just shared? The largest uh, takeaways for me are that we need to start having conversations around how we can in improve the long-term health outcomes of individuals starting from when they're children or when they're babies, right? Even starting with maternal health really, right? Because if we can then, um, if we can ensure or improve the healthcare outcomes of mothers, we, we know based on evidence that it can, this can actually impact the healthcare outcomes of children. Um, and a lot of the things that can impact the healthcare of mothers then leads us into the conversation around healthcare disparities. And, and, and a lot of it is stuff that is not within the control of the mother. So there's macroeconomic conditions, there's public health and health policies, there's culture and values, and a lot of things that determine health in general that are not within the control of individuals. Even gender, um, some, sometimes income and education are things that are out of reach for individuals. Um, so, you know, again, from a policy perspective, being able to control some of these things can actually help improve um, healthcare equity. Okay, so we know in microbiome that differences in composition can result from ethnic individuality. And a lot of these are factors to do with diet, lifestyle, socioeconomic conditions, cultural practices, and genetic ancestry. And this, is, this information is largely from large cohort studies from across the globe. So notably, we know that um, there's also increased risk for certain conditions based on your ethnicity. And so if you put these two together, you can begin to see the potential that the microbiome has for being able to provide personalized medicine approach or personalized healthcare interventions for specific ethnic groups based on the microbiome profile, based on um, their diets, their lifestyle, based on socioeconomic conditions. You can begin to craft a really specific way of caring for different groups of people, which can help to then reduce the gap, right, for healthcare equity. And so we, just as I mentioned, we can use ethnicity associated and microbiome composition to link the influence of factors like ethnicity associated dietary or cultural patterns with healthcare disparity etiology. And this can help with policy, this can help um, even in the, in, the, in the hospital or in clinical practice. So Again, while individuals and governments are working right now to address the public policy, societal factors that underlie health disparities, we have a role, if you're a researcher in the audience, um, we have a role to play to leverage some of the studies we perform um, by prioritizing microbiomes, by ethnicity, and disease by microbiome associations to build a foundation for therapies that are for specific ethnicities. And then um, this is a quote from um, Andrew Brooks. It was an editorial that I found particularly compelling. And what he said is, you know, as a culture addressing injustices in access to healthcare and fresh food, socioeconomic mobility and many other factors underlying disparities is an ideal, right? It's ideal, but it's long-term, it's protracted to pursue equality in health outcomes. So right now, what can we do? Practical approaches that leverage these um, ethnicity associated microbiomes for clues about contributing factors to increased risk for disease can help to uh, provide you know, lifestyle interventions for health disparities that are worth pursuing. So that, that you know, is pretty powerful to me being a microbiome scientist to know that we can actually utilize some of this in that way. Okay, so how can we benefit from all of this just across the board? Scott talked about this, microbiome-directed interventions. We can have untargeted interventions, and Scott talks, talked about probiotics, right, right down there, um, and then probiotic foods. There's also prebiotics, which typically are foods or supplements. There's postbiotics, there's synbiotics. There's a lot of biotics, as you as you've heard, um, but typically there's also fecal microbiota transplantation, which we're using currently to treat uh, Clostridium, Clostridioides difficile um, infection um, in a chronic way. Um, so this was just approved by the FDA. 
a few months ago as a, the first therapeutic. And then we have individualized nutrition. So we can actually take information based on your microbiome and build a personalized nutrition profile, which would be you know, easier to hopefully um, adapt to because it's, it's customized to you. Exercise is also one of the ways we've shown we can actually um, target the, the microbiome. And this leads to general improvement in microbial composition and functions. But there's also targeted approaches, um, genetic modification of strains to, to perform certain functions, such as work as an antibiotic. So instead of taking an antibiotic uh, chemical, you would take a bug or a bacterium which has a phage to eliminate an infectious disease. That's one, one of the uh, pathways, but there are multiple targeted ways to, to treat some different disease indications. So in conclusion, I would like to quote the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates, and say that, you know, just as he said, all disease begins in the gut, and he said this so long ago, it's true today, we can say that um, a lot of diseases begin in the gut, and our food should be our medicine, our medicine should be our food. Why? Because, hey, the diet determines the lot is the largest determinant of your microbiome. So you can control that piece at least. You can you can make a difference. All right, thank you. No questions now. The questions can come um, later on during the panel discussion. Thanks for your time. Yes, thank you. Please put your questions in the chat now. I'm I'm adding them all together for the panel session, and I just want to thank our first two speakers, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Nevro. Those were incredible talks. I was totally nerding out on them, which of course I was going to because I love the microbiome, but we've been receiving a lot of messages from the attendees about how much they're enjoying them. Um, and so thank you so much for that. Um, and then we are gonna take a quick break now. It would be a great time to you know get up and stretch, maybe get a little exercise in, think about questions you wanna add to the chat, um, but do come back and let's see, we are starting again at 2.55 Eastern time. That's 2.55 Eastern daylight time. Uh, and we will have Dr. Chris Dammon and myself talk and then the panel discussion, which you will not want to miss. Enjoy your break.
Right, I'm going to go ahead and, and get us going here again. Our next speaker uh, is Dr. Chris Dennett. 
Dr. Damon is a clinical associate professor and practicing gastroenterologist at the University of Washington in the Department of Medicine Division of Gastroenterology. He is former initiative lead of function food, microbiome, and gut health in the enteric and diarrheal diseases team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He holds an MD from Columbia University and an MA in molecular biology and biochemistry from Wesleyan University. He moved west to complete his residency in internal medicine and fellowship in gastroenterology at the University of Washington. Chris continued on at the University of Washington with a joint appointment in the Division of Gastroenterology and the Fred Hutchinson Can Cancer Research Center. He maintains an academic appointment with the University of Washington with research interests focused on investigating the role of diet and microbiome-directed therapies as treatments for inflammatory bowel disease. Past research activities have included early drug discovery work at Pfizer's Discovery Technology Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and epidemiological surveillance work characterizing plasmodium drug resistance genes at the Armed Forces Research Institute of Medical Sciences in Bangkok, Thailand. Outside of work, Dr. Damon likes to spend his time running, cooking, eating, and spending time with his wife and three daughters. And I have to say that that sounds like almost everyone on this call. So maybe there's something to that. <laughs> and I'd also add that I personally really enjoy working with Chris and we just planned a microbiome conference earlier this week where I got to see him in person here in DC. So it's nice to see you again this week, Chris, and I will turn it over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that really kind introduction, Lee. And it, 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 it's tickling, but also at the same time, a little embarrassing to hear all those words. And I would say that last sentence is probably the most important one. And also, I feel like, you know, we're all fellow scientists and clinicians trying to make a difference. That's what this all boils down to. And so I want to keep that first and foremost uh, in my mind, uh, in our minds, as uh, we go through the next uh, several slides uh, and presentation. Um, I want to thank Yvonne for teeing things up uh, very nicely uh, with her last few slides in terms of what can we do to actually intervene uh, when it comes to the microbiome. And that will be the theme of the ensuing uh, next several slides. So with that, let me share my screen. And is that coming through? Yes, it looks good. Perfect. And we'll get started. All right, so I like to start simple. Um, and simply put, uh, you could think of our bodies as a metaphor. And that metaphor is as simple as we are tubes. We have a mouth, we have an out, and we put food into it. And that food is transferred, transmitted, um, transformed into the nutrients that fuel our cells, our organs, and our body. Let's keep that simplicity in mind. Uh, we'll come back to it uh, as we cover um, some complexities in the middle. And not dissimilar from Scott uh, Gartner's hype cycle, uh, there's another curve that I really like, and this is the curve of inquiry. Uh, it's the curve of understanding. And when we start asking a question, we start what might be called in the valley of ignorance. We don't know the answer. And as we explore things, things get very, very complex. And yet as we continue to explore things more, things start to click and come together. And we find a clarity that we didn't quite understand at the beginning, but was not really all that different from where we started. And so that will hopefully be the arc of this talk. Uh, and maybe the arc of our inquiry into the microbiome and nutrition in general. Now, where I started this journey in terms of metabolic disease uh, was at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we were studying women and children and trying to make their lives better um, to improve malnutrition, preterm birth. And what became painfully obvious to me was this double burden of malnutrition, where truly it was equal parts undernutrition and overnutrition, if we can simplify it such as that. That really um, lit a flame in me that in order to really short circuit malnutrition at large, it was a problem that was going to have to be attacked, not just in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, but also right here at home. Least the problems that we have developed over recent years uh, be replicated across the world. 
And this is the problem that we face. It's daunting, it's scary, it's overwhelming, and it's unfathomable. Um, the incidence of overweight and obesity of 73%, perhaps even higher now. The incidence of prediabetes and diabetes of 45% at staggering costs, not just in dollars, but in lives. So how do we begin to wrap our minds around short-circuiting this problem? I always like to start with a bird's eye view and think of what is everything that could be contributing? What is the holistic perspective? And for that, I have a simple acronym that I've put together, which I call the four M's of health and disease. Those four M's are simply put molecules, microbes, movement, and mind. And each one of these is a double edge. For mind, there's the positive of sleep and mindfulness versus insomnia and stress. For movement, there is activity, but there's also sedentarism. For microbes, there's microbiome, but also pathogens. For molecules, there's food, but also toxins. At the base of all of this, what is it that provides the foundation? And I would argue it's community. It's the connections that we have with each other that give us purpose with our colleagues, with our friends, with our family. But as we think, where can we intervene? Truly all of these things would be impactful if we could find interventions. But I like to think, what are the levers that we can move that will disproportionately affect the problem? And I might put my finger down on molecules. Now I'm a microbiome person, and certainly microbiome interventions will absolutely be critical and part of the solution. But if I had to choose one thing, it would be food as it impacts the microbiome. So let's dive deeper. What do we know about food? We've known for a long time now how to eat well. There's countless research that supports the Mediterranean diet. There's also new research that supports ultra processed foods as contributing to many health outcomes that are adverse. Obesity, diabetes, all cause mortality, even cancer, and the list goes on. There's also interventional studies that support ultra processed foods as contributing to weight gain. As this very nicely controlled study done by Kevin Hall et al at the National Institute of Health. In it, the study's subjects, subjects were indentured servants. <laughs> In some ways, um, that's an appropriate way to call them because they uh, were interred at the NIH uh, for two weeks and provided two different diets in a crossover study, ultra versus minimally processed diet. And what was found is despite being the same number of calories, the same number of nutrients, the same amount of fiber, albeit perhaps a simplified type of fiber and maybe not the best type of prebiotic fiber, guar gum, they found that the minimally processed versus ultra processed led to differences in body weight gain, which also correlated with differences in sodium intake, fat-free mass, body weight, and gut hormones, GLP-1 and GIP. All right, so I've said ultra processed foods are associated with these adverse health outcomes, but what is ultra processed foods? What are they? Well, this is a definition uh, that came about by the NOVA classification, grouping foods into different types and amounts of processing, one, two, three, and four. Group four, which involves extracting, chemically modifying, reassembling, these are the ultra processed foods. But more precisely, what is it about ultra processed foods that makes them unhealthy? If we can understand that better, I think we'll be much closer to solving this problem. And there's theories that have been put forward certainly added bad things, too much salt, too much sugar, fat, additives. Another theory is it's not just too much of these things, but how they come together in specific combinations of salt, sugar, and fat. Another theory is that it's not just the things, it's not just the individual parts, but it's the sum of those parts, it's the whole, it's the synergy, it's the disrupted matrix of the foods and the cells that make them up. And then lastly, it's, it's perhaps the missing things, not just the bad things that are present in ultra processed foods, but what's been taken out, the fibers, the phytonutrients, the bioactive fats. And so processing has existed really since the beginning of time. 
Um, but some of the processing may be more adverse than others. For example, take whole grains. Processing that removes the bran and the germ uh, removes critical fibers, phytonutrients, and healthy fats. Furthermore, when you take the endosperm and you mill it into a fine powder, that decreases the amount of a different type of fiber called resistant starch. To add insult to injury, then further processing in terms of removing oils, uh, bleaching flour, um, further disrupts the natural state of that food, the matrix, and the relative ratios of the nutrients within that food. So what if we added these things back? And what's ironic is the things that are now waste could become the very things that make us healthy, turned into therapeutics, medical foods, and supplements. And I'm a pragmatist. Um, when I give these talks, I say, number one, two, and three, we need to maximize whole foods. We need to increase the amount of whole foods that we're getting into our diet, and we need to come up with new and innovative ways to do that. In addition to that, though, I believe that there is an important element to the comprehensive solution that involves introducing better for you processed foods. There's different monikers for this. One is functional foods. And this approach involves what if we could capitalize on the benefits of those processed foods, the convenience, the familiarity, the shelf stability, the cost of goods, and yet at the same time, maintain and maximize the health benefits by adding the key things back that we've taken out. Well, Hippocrates, who was aptly quoted uh, in the last talk said, let food be thy medicine. This is the modernist um, revision. So let fibers, phenols, bioactive fats, and ferments, what I call the four phonetic Fs, be thy medicine. Perhaps this is the reductionist approach to what's been removed and what needs to be added back, either in the whole foods that you see here, or as we understand these whole foods better, in a 70-30 proposition, albeit we will never be as good as whole foods, can we get closer with the current processed foods? Can we make them better? by adding some of these key bioactives back. And as I uh, mentioned before with the four Fs, what are the key levers? What are the things that we think can move disproportionately health? And I might put my finger down on fibers. Now, why is that? There's uh, plenty of epidemiological evidence that supports the benefit of fiber in terms of health outcomes. Uh, All-cause mortality improved, cardiovascular disease improved. Um, beyond that, interventional studies with fiber specifically uh, in isolated form, whether it be alpha-glucan, beta-glucan, arabinoxylan, fructan, lactan, mannan, in 45 different randomized placebo-controlled trials in a meta-analysis show this force plot uh, result, where categorically, uh, there was a significant improvement in things like hemoglobin A1C, um, HDL, LDL, triglycerides, BMI, weight, blood pressure. Um, so how might fiber be having this effect? It's complex. There's many mechanisms at play. Uh, and as a gastroenterologist, uh, anatomically, I separate these into two different compartments uh, within the GI tract. There's the upper gut and the lower gut. And the mechanisms at play here are different. In the upper gut, what predominates is the role of the viscosity of the fiber in slowing gastric emptying time and in creating a diffusion gradient of those nutrients as they um, move towards the epithelium, the lining of the gut, uh, to where they can be absorbed. In addition to that, fibers also can modulate the key transporters that exist within the small intestine for taking up things like glucose. Now that's the upper gut mechanism, that's a rapid mechanism, but there's also another mechanism and that mechanism is most relevant to the conversation that we're having today. And that is how fibers can grow the microbiome that's present, not just in the colon, but in the last part of the small intestine as well, the terminal ileum. 
the fibers that can't be digested, that can't be absorbed by our own digestive enzymes made by the pancreas and other organs, make their way down to the colon, where the microbes then have their turn at the leftovers. It's the doggy bags of the colon, of the GI tract. And they turn these fibers into things that are incredibly relevant to our health. Metabolites that are bioactive, that have direct impact on the gut and beyond. This is just another schematic of how that fiber is undigested, makes it down into the small intestine, last part, the large intestine, is turned into these bioactives. One of the critical ones is a short chain fatty acid called butyrate. And how butyrate then stimulates key gut hormones like GLP-1, which have been prominent uh, in the media uh, in, in uh, recent weeks to months. Um, and so much as uh, they are the active ingredient in things like Wagovi, these new blockbuster and somewhat controversial weight loss drugs. Well, GLP-1 is a master regulator of metabolism. It has an impact on the brain, uh, on our appetite. It impacts the pancreas and how much insulin is secreted and glucagon. It impacts the stomach and how rapidly the stomach empties impacts the liver and how much glucose is liberated from glycogen, impacts the muscle and how much glucose is taken up as well as fat, how much fat is stored. And overall, the way this impacts um, the way we experience the nutrients within our meal, you see here on the right, there's a low glycemic index and a high glycemic index uh, meal. And the first meal effect on postprandial blood glucose, these curves. And naturally, the low glycemic index meal is going to have a lower curve. What's fascinating, though, is in the second meal, in which case it's a standardized meal, it's not lower high glycemic index. The only difference between these two arms is what was ingested in that very first meal. You see a persistent difference in the postprandial glucose. That's a delayed effect. That's an effect that's relevant to the microbiome that's producing butyrate that's then stimulating GLP-1 from the GI tract. Well, I'm talking generally about fibers, but truly not all fibers are created equal. And just as I think in terms of mechanisms of upper and lower gut and how fiber impacts our overall health, similarly, one needs to think in terms of upper and lower gut, in terms of how fibers may be good for some people and for others cause symptoms. Some fibers can be categorized as high FODMAP uh, fibers and some as low FODMAP fibers. FODMAP is a mouthful. It stands for fermentable oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And what that essentially boils down to is fibers that are either rapidly digested, the high FODMAP fibers in the upper gut that can in some people that have susceptibility like IBS and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth to lead to symptoms of bloating, looser stools, and sometimes uh, frank diarrhea. Whereas the low FODMAP fibers, these are fibers that are slower to be digested, to be uh, fermented, and tend to be fermented more in the lower gut categorically, regardless of whether somebody has IBS or SIBO. And you can see just some of the listed fibers here, the low FODMAP fibers uh, being things like psyllium and arabinoxyla, beta-glucan, resistant starch, the high FODMAP fibers being things like uh, fructans and inulin, um, things belonging to the onion family. And on the right, you can see some of the key uh, categories of plants and you know, which of these uh, foods falls into high and low FODMAP fibers. It's a bit complicated. Um, generally, uh, when I talk to uh, patients about uh, FODMAP fibers, I say it's probably best that you talk with somebody who's actually trained in FODMAPs and um, will we'll work closely with a registered dietitian. Now, what if we focus on some of these low FODMAP fibers and look specifically at how they're impacting health? And this is a, a small pilot that was done uh, looking at beta-glucan and resistant starch. Um, and it was done in a very small group of individuals, just five subjects that were consuming super high glycemic index foods. Uh, strangely, things like Rice Krispies and rice milk uh, being one of the worst offenders, but also bagels and apple juice, uh, biscuits, etc. 
These are pooled curves of those five subjects and those six different meals that were consumed uh, for breakfast on six different days. And you'll see that the postprandial area under the curve decreased by 30 to 40%. This is embodiment of that first mechanism uh, that was highlighted in the earlier slide of how fibers can actually decrease the postprandial area under the curve. Now, this is another study that was done. It's a uh, randomized placebo-controlled trial uh, that involved almost 200 individuals uh, with three different arms, randomized in a two-to-one-to-one -to -one design. One arm was a shake that uh, contains the same uh, mix of dietary fibers, as well as protein and fat and micronutrients. Uh, another shake that was isochloric, isoprotein, isonutrient, but missing those prebiotic fibers. And then a last arm, which just provided dietary guidance. That dietary guidance was provided across all three arms, uh, but that was the only part of the intervention in that third arm. Um, these interventions were provided uh, for a total of three months. Um, and on average, people had um, one of these meal replacement formulas uh, one to two times a day. And the outcomes that were measured, the primary outcome was a quality of life measure, um, which is very well validated uh, and studied in the context of diabetes, something called the diabetes distress score. But also um, hard metabolic outcomes like hemoglobin A1C, weight, blood pressure, as well as biomarkers, including uh, fecal uh, metagenomics in collaboration with Stanford and Justin Sonnenberg's uh, group uh, were measured. And here are the results. Uh, so primary uh, outcome, uh, this is the diabetes distress score, and it's a composite of eight different questions. You can see the pooled responses up on top. Uh, green is the active arm, which is the formula that included the prebiotic, uh, and uh, placebo uh, is blue, and diet alone is red. And you can see active relative to placebo in the pooled data uh, showed a significant improvement. Uh, in the quality of life measure, the diabetes distress score. You can also see that the sub uh, measures, although not significant, um, categorically moved um, in a positive improvement direction uh, with the active intervention, uh, whereas uh, less so with both the placebo and the diet. Uh, here are the hard clinical um, measure outcomes and hemoglobin A1C, uh, active versus intervention, uh, same color scheme, green versus blue, uh, uh, was significantly improved. Uh, weight, uh, blood pressure, and systolic blood pressure, just like the meta-analysis, also trended uh, towards improvement. Now, um, this is a microbiome conference. So what was seen uh, uh, in stool uh, with microbiome analysis, uh, working with Dr. Sonnenberg? Uh, what we found uh, was quite interesting. Uh, there was a trend towards increase in the primary degraders of the two key fibers, o beta glucan and resistant starch, which you can see in the upper left here, Ruminococcus bromi, and then different bifidobacterium species. And there was also an increase in secondary degraders with significant increases in our thesis and ahedris specifically. Now, this is how fibers are generally degraded. You have very specific primary degraders that map almost one-to-one -one with those primary fibers. So opiate glucan tends to be degraded by these four organisms, resistant starch, uh, more so by ruminococcus bromi and different bifidobacterium species. And they produce acetate. Acetate then uh, is consumed by the more generalized secondary degraders, the Clostridium cluster 4 and 14a species that you see here, mouthful names like Fecalibacterium prosnitzii, that then produce other short chain fatty acids, the, the key star uh, short chain fatty acid, butyrate, but also propionate. All right. So we focused uh, so far on how. Um, fiber uh, is being translated by the gut microbiome uh, into things like short chain fatty acids. But the story is actually much more complex. Um, and everything that's present within food, all of the things that we don't absorb that make it down into the colon, like phenols and fats and ferments, are also translated uh, into uh, other bioactives like B vitamins, modified polyphenols, conjugated fats, other adverse things like TMAO uh, that was highlighted uh, in an earlier talk. 
Where I think we can um, stand to um, have great insights uh, and um, uh, movements in our understanding is how all these bioactives then in specific ways impact overall health. And my hypothesis is that the mitochondria may be one of the very key linchpins uh, in how this is translated, whether it's directly those bioactives impacting epigenetic regulation of the mitochondria um, through pathways like histone deacetylase uh, inhibitors uh, and or sirtuin pathways, um, but also indirectly. Um, and then how that then translates into things like hormones, cytokines, neurotransmitters uh, that impact overall health. I think as we understand better this microbiome mitochondria access, the impact of the microbiome on all the different organ systems and the associations that we've seen with the microbiome uh, with all the different diseases will become a lot more clear. Um, and so here are all the other diseases that have been associated. And this is the, um, the key axis of the microbiome of mitochondria. Now, this complex understanding um, will be very important for medicine as differentiated from public health. If an individual is sick, if an individual has disrupted homeostasis, interventions that get very technical and nitty gritty and that dissect the microbiome pathways that may intervene with specific microbes to fill gaps, that may intervene with very specific food type interventions. This is the sweet spot uh, for that sort of intervention. Um, and you'll see addressing things like the intergenerational nature of obesity, um, where it's not just genetics, it's heritability at large that involves epigenetics and microbiome transfer and shared environment. This then becomes possible to intervene in as we understand these pathways better. Similarly, somebody has an allergic disease, autoimmune disease, metabolic disease, neurological disease that's connected to the microbiome. With precision, we may be able to, in the future, intervene with a prebiotic food and or a microbe or a collection of microbes to help ameliorate that. These are tailored therapies. But in addition to that, I'm a believer in simplicity. And as I said, we've come full circle back to where we started. And that is, how can we simplify this very, very complex field? And I think it simplifies down to something as basic as, um, if folks remember the field of dreams and Kevin Costner, he said, if you build it, they will come, uh, referring to the baseball field. Uh, similarly, I think if you feed them, they will come. These microbes, albeit uh, underrepresented, either in our guts or in society, will come back, they'll flourish. They're not completely gone. And so here's the hypothesis. As we've had this rise in incidence of metabolic disease, obesity and diabetes and other diet-related diseases that truly started with an inflection point in the mid 70s, hypothesis being that a lot of this is stemming, albeit not all of it, but a lot of it is stemming from ultra processing. And as much the added bad as the missing good, these four phonetic Fs, what if we can imagine a future, and this is the hypothesis, where we truly do find new ways to increase whole foods and as a pragmatist, increase the functional foods, make those processed foods better so that we can get these four Fs back into our diet so we can feed our microbiome so our partners in health can actually help support our health. Well, how are we gonna do this? It's going to be through new products that are better for you, that have these prebiotic fibers, but it's also about behavior change and maybe tapping into new technologies like smart apps that help make food choice easier. And this is a project that I've been noodling on uh, in the margins and I'm quite uh, excited about. And it's reducing the complexity of nutrition facts, which truthfully, even I have a hard time. My eyes go cross-eyed. Um, and you know, at my age even, uh, it's getting a little bit blurry trying to see the fine print on um, these nutrition facts labels. What if we could just simply scan the UPC code and have that translated through an algorithm 
capturing these key ratios, carb to fiber, sodium to potassium, saturated fats, unsaturated fat, and energy to weight, and turn that into a score that allows you in your busy life, um, on the go, make quick, simple decisions that also have this personalized um, uh, uh, input. Uh, so for example, if you need low FODMAP, if you're working on hypertension, that's all entered uh, at the front and provides alternate healthier suggestions to you. So this is the, 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 the vision for change. You have better information at the touch of the consumer or the individual or the patient's fingertips. And you have better foods in addition to the whole foods that then lead to this chain reaction of events. It's a grassroots approach with early adopters, industry awakening, mass adoption, and ultimately health improving. Well, I promised we'd start back where we started. And we started with tubes, we started with simplicity, and here we are again. What if we could imagine a future where under and over nutrition could be improved through some simple interventions, adding back some of the missing bioactives of whole and functional foods? So with that, um, would love to acknowledge the key people uh, and institutions that have been involved in this work, certainly, um, the company that sponsored uh, the research uh, and the product SuperGut, uh, Stanford and Justin Sonnenberg, uh, the University of Washington. Uh, and then I also uh, keep a, a, a blog uh, called Gut Bites. Uh, and there's a prototype of the calculator and even a sign up uh, to be a beta tester of the first downloadable calculator that's based on nutrient ratios of the matrix of whole foods. Um, so with that, I think uh, we're holding on uh, questions, but look forward to answering questions uh, at the wake of the meeting. And uh, great thanks uh, to Lee and uh, all the organizers, um, uh, as well as the audience for bearing with me uh, over the last several uh, minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. And we do have questions coming in. Please keep them going. Put your questions in the chat. Um, up next, uh, Dr. Andrew Heyman is going to give us a brief introduction of myself. Hmm. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's so nice to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Frame. Um, she's done so many wonderful things for our program and for this conference in particular. Um, and now she gets to share some of her uh, content expertise on a subject that, you know, really uh, forms a lot of the core of, of her uh, academic and, and clinical work. Um, so uh, Dr. Frame uh, currently is uh, the, the Director of Integrative Medicine uh, here at George Washington University, and she's the Associate Director uh, of Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. She's also the executive director itself of the Office of Integrative Medicine and Health and an assistant professor here in our uh, Department of Health Sciences and Clinical Research and Leadership and an assistant professor in physician assistant uh, studies. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Frame brings nutrition and immunity together through clinical and translational research and her T-shaped expertise in health, wellness, science, and medicine. Uh, was developed through her wide-ranging experience in biomedical research uh, from wet bench to clinical research and overseeing research and education programs. Her interests include the role of the microbiome and nutrition and health, the consequences of malnutrition and obesity, vitamin D as an immune modul modulatory hormone, research ethics, and science communication. Uh, she's been building the GW Integrated Medicine Research Program while directing the graduate education programs uh, here at GW and the Office of Integrated Medicine and Health and the Resiliency and Wellbeing Center. So thanks, Dr. Frame, for being with us today. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I am really excited about this. So everyone set me up very nicely for this talk. Thank you all. Um, that might have been a little bit by design. <laughs> Uh, but now we're going to maybe take a little bit of a slight different direction. So one of the things that is really important when we think about the gut microbiome is what else it affects in the body, because the whole body is connected. And that's a really important tenet in integrative medicine, is that the whole body is connected. You can't just study one part of it um, without looking at the whole system. And so the the gut is also connected to the brain. And that's what I'm gonna talk about, the microbiome gut brain axis. 
okay, first uh, conflict of interest, none of which affected the contents of this talk. So first I want to talk about how this is a bi-directional relationship. Uh, so it's not just gut talking to the brain or brain talking to the gut, it's also the the gut talking to the brain and how are they connected? So there's a few main types of connections, one being a nervous connection, and that's through the vagal nerve. So the brain can talk to the gut and the gut can talk to the brain through the vagal nerve. The other one is endocrine. So hormones can be released by the brain, allowing it to talk to the gut. And we'll talk a little bit about whether that works the other direction as well. Then there's also immune signaling. So the immune system will react to what it sees in either site and create cytokines, inflammatory cytokines or anti-inflammatory cytokines to either launch a robust immune response or to, to calm the immune system and just go into a surveillance mode, the homeostasis mode. And it can happen in either site and will affect actually the whole body. So immunity is really a great example of where you have to have that integrative approach because if there's an immune reaction in one part of the body, it's really going to spread pretty quickly to the rest of the body. And so we have to look at the whole body when we're when we're looking at the immune system. And then, of course, there are interactions between these two, which I'm not going to get into the purpose of this talk, but I did put them there for those of you who are interested in that. OK, so let's talk about brain to gut communication. This is probably what you are most interested in uh, when you think or what most uh, not interested in most familiar with, right? We all know the brain is talking to the gut because the brain is the master communicator, right? It's telling everybody what to do. Um, so how does it do that? There, there are indirect effects uh, and it does that via motility. Um, so there's a, a strong correlation between the gut microbiome, its composition, its richness, its diversity, and how quickly food moves through your gut. And a lot of that is actually controlled through the brain. Uh, and so that's one way the brain can control the gut microbiome. Uh, and a reduced motility has been linked to a number of diseases, one of which is called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO. And the key here is that it's bacterial overgrowth. So there's too many of these bacteria in the small intestine, which typically, as, as Yvonne pointed out, um, does not have quite as much bacteria in it as, say, the colon does. And so here we're seeing too much of a good thing. That's what's going on with SIBO. And that happens when we have this reduced intestinal transit time. The so things are sitting around too long. And then you can also have a reduce in biomass and diversity in the gut as well. Uh, and that's really kind of a the opposite coin of that. So here, instead of having too much of a good thing, here we have too little. Um, and so we can have either extreme due to the same effect motility. And so that's one of the things that's really complicated about this is it's not always very clear exactly what the outcome is going to be. You could say, oh, this person has reduced gut motility, but you don't know whether it's going to be too much or too little. And each person is slightly different. Um, and that's also a really key tenet of integrative medicine is that we have to look at the individual in front of us and, and not the average person. Person, uh, because in many cases, there really isn't an average person. There's going to be a number of different phenotypes that will show up, and we have to see what this person is expressing. Is it too much or too little in this case? Uh, so the brain controls secretion of things like uh, bile acids and other uh, important chemicals into the gut, which can affect uh, both digestion as well as the gut microbiome. And then one of the ones that I get kind of excited about is intestinal permeability. And again, uh, Yvonne had explained this really nicely and with that beautiful graph that's showing the, the gut microbiome or the, the gut should be really tightly connected, the different cells. And when they become less tightly connected, then you have a leaky gut. And when things are getting through your gut that shouldn't get through your gut, your immune system is like, whoa, this doesn't belong here. And what happens is it starts uh, an inflammation cascade, which is what it's supposed to do. When something isn't in the body that it's not supposed to be there, it's supposed to sound the alarm and, and mount uh, an invasion. But that's not a good thing to have all the time. And when you have this increased intestinal permeability or leaky gut, this is happening all the time, and that's what we call chronic inflammation. And chronic inflammation is at the at the root of many of our chronic diseases. Uh, and we did actually do a whole talk about inflammation and chronic diseases. We have we can put that link as well to to link to our cross disciplinary biomedical uh, seminar series on that. Uh, what else does the brain do to the gut? So I alluded to this already, the vagus nerve. It's a big player here. It's innervating pretty much everything. The brain needs to talk to the whole digestive system. Uh, and through that, it can actually secrete molecules into the gut. 
And it does that via the lamina propria for those of you who are interested in the anatomy of it. Uh, but it's actually this part of the gut that is innervated directly by the vagus nerve. So this nerve goes directly into the gut. And this is a really important part of the gut uh, where a lot of the activity is going on in terms of the immune system and secretion and um, uh, actually immune education as well. So really important area. So it makes sense that the brain would want to be able to have, you know, a, a direct line to this area. Uh, then the brain is going to receive information from the vagus nerve. And when it receives that information, it's going to say, what should we do? And if there's a problem, we'll call it dysbiosis or gut microbiota imbalance. We don't have great terminology here, but we're going to just roll with that. Um, it will say, okay, we got to do something. Let's mount a response. Let's cause inflammation. Let's activate the immune system. And again, having that chronically activated is not good. So how do we get rid of that? Well, what we have is the parasympathetic, parasympathetic response. Once that is activated via the brain, we go into rest and digest mode. That already sounds good, right? We don't want to be hyped up and crazy and, and ooh, anxious. We want to rest and digest. And that is an anti-inflammatory mode. And this is another thing where integrative medicine really excels, right? One of the things we talk about is um, meditation, mindfulness, stress management, uh, moving your body, fueling your body so you can get into a healthy parasympathetic state instead of always being in this highly activated sympathetic state, which I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. First, what has the vagus nerve been shown to be important for? So we've showed that it has a decreased activity and it's association, so that is not necessarily causation, uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and then gastric dysfunction. And we're talking about motility and emptying here. And we already know motility is really important. So we shouldn't be surprised by any of this. Um, but there's clearly a role to play for the vagus nerve in these, even if it's not necessarily the direct cause of these diseases. And one of the more elegant examples of this. Now it's in a it's in a rodent model, so we have to take it with a grain of salt because these things don't always translate so well to humans. But in this rodent model, they were able to give a probiotic. So they gave this single bug here, Bifidobacterium longum. And what happened was it actually benefited. It, it improved this vagus nerve activity and, and, and the symptoms associated with it. Now they took those same rodents and they did a vagotomy. And what is a vagotomy? That's where they're actually disconnecting the vagus nerve from the gut. So now the brain can't talk to the gut. It no longer has that direct line of communication. And the effect of the probiotic was gone. It, they no longer had that improvement. Okay, well, maybe they just needed to have more probiotic. So in the next step, they gave more probiotic, but they weren't able to re reproduce the effect they had seen with the probiotic after the vagotomy. So we can reason that the effect of the probiotic is likely through the vagus nerve through this, at least in rodents. What about the other way? Let's say, how is the gut microbiome commuting to the brain? So there are indirect methods, signal transmitters, short-chain fatty acids, which you've heard about today. Um, uh, one thing that's important about short-chain fatty acids, it's fuel for colonocytes. You probably hear that when you hear about gut health is you can prevent leaky gut by feeding your colonocytes and they, they their food is short-chain fatty acids. And the short-chain fatty acids are produced from fermentation of fiber by your gut microbiome. But what you might not know is those short-chain fatty acids are also fuel for the brain microglia, so cells in the brain. And some of these short-chain fatty acids travel from the gut through the circulation up to the brain and cross the blood-brain barrier and actually fuel the brain microglia. And so that is an indirect method because it's got to go through circulation. And then it, it also, um, the gut can also secrete secondary bile acids, which are regulated by the brain. So that's a little bit of a, you know, bi-directional. And then also tryptophan metabolites, uh, which you can see a, a depiction of this over here. So if we look at dietary tryptophan, it is, you know, you, you eat something with tryptophan in it and your body is starting to digest it. What happens is the gut will sense that. And there is some um, processing of the tryptophan into various different metabolites, um, including what we have here as 5-HT, which is basically serotonin. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter, which Yvonne again talked about. It's important for uh, brain function. And because this, this serotonin is able to cross into these ECCs, which are over here, the enterochromaffin cells, which are directly interacting with the vagus nerve, the brain is being told through the amount of serotonin what's going on in the gut and then can react to it and, and send signals back. So that is an indirect mechanism as well because it's got to travel into the ECC, then through the vagus nerve and then up to the brain. 
So there are signal receivers. There are the uh, enteroendocrine cells, the enterochromaffin cells, mucosal immune cells. And this one's a big one. A large portion, you see, you hear a lot of numbers out there. It's not overly precise because it's going to be different at any one time period, any different person, but somewhere on the order of 70 to 80% of your immune cells at any one given time are in your gut. They are actually hanging out in your gut and they are being educated and getting ready uh, for if they are needed to mount a response. And so because they're hanging out in your gut, they're really, they're, you know, they're seeing what's going on here and thus they're highly reactive to what's going on. So if you have a leaky gut and, um, LPS, a, a component that comes from bacteria, gets through that gut, those immune system cells are right there and they're going to see it, they're going to start inflammation, they're going to start reacting to it. And in some ways, that's a good thing because if we have a pathogen that gets through the gut, we really want to get on that quickly and, and stop uh, sepsis or, or full body infection. Um, but if it's this chronic inflammation, we know that's not good. And so we really have to figure out how to turn off that chronic inflammation. Other signal receivers, circulation, which I did talk about, and then, of course, the ever popular vagus nerve. What else do you need to know about gut microbiome to brain communication? The, the real key here is the HPA axis, and I already alluded to this a little bit. And what is the HPA axis? It's a complex neural immunoregulatory mechanism. And all it is is that rest and digest or fight, flight, freeze mode. So we've got the anti-inflammatory parasympathetic rest and digest, the inflammatory sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze. And we need both of them, but we can't live here. We can't live in fight, flight, and freeze because as the name suggests, then we won't be resting and recharging and we won't be digesting. So we need both. Um, and in order to have the rest and digest, we need to have the proper vagal signals from the gut, and they're going to act on the hypothalamus and the hippocampus in the brain directly and, and allow us to have that parasympathetic state. And there are many different ways to create a parasympathetic state. Um, some of them are included in your gut health. Uh, but what happens when we have a sympathetic state? Often it's from this mucosa disruption, this leaky gut, LPS is a major player in that, or from pro-inflammatory cytokines, that chronic inf inflammation I was talking about, or you could have exaggerated AP HPA activation for a number of reasons, and that's actually something that Dr. Heyman specializes in. Uh, and importantly, this is seen in cases of IBS, as well as some psychological disorders, including depression, and maybe contributing or perhaps even causing at least portions of those disorders. And so what disorders are players here? So we have functional GI disorders that are, are involved in this altered communication, IBS, IBD. And then psychiatric and neurological ones, affective mood disorders, such as uh, major depressive disorder, perhaps autism spectrum disorder, Parkinson's disease, MS, and then chronic pain. But the key here is these are all correlated and correlation is not causation. Uh, this is a key thing that I learned at the Hopkins School of Public Health. So thank you to my professors. Uh, that just because something is associated with it, it's linked to it, doesn't mean it's actually the cause. There can be something called reverse causation, uh, but there could also be something where this is only part of the reason. Um, and so we need to do more research here to really understand this. But I think this is a really interesting area for research. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little about the diet. Uh, I love talking about this topic. <laughs> um, the, there's two ways of looking about the diet when it comes to the microbiome. The first is short-term short diet changes. I like to use the example that you know, you're know you typically on a healthy diet and your microbiome is pretty good. And then maybe you go on vacation or you go to a scientific conference or somewhere where you can't have your usual food and you're maybe you're eating out a lot more, you're eating fast food. Um, your microbiome is not gonna like it. It's gonna get unhappy, it's gonna change. But the good news is as long as it's a short, relatively short period of time and you go back to your regular healthy diet, it bounces right back. It's gonna take a little bit of time, but it will bounce right back. The other way of thinking is long-term dietary changes. And what does that mean long-term? Well, we can't really precisely narrow it down at this point, but it's probably on the order of 12 to 18 months. And at that point, um, the microbiome is actually altered. So let's say you don't have a healthy diet and you're like, I really want to improve my gut health after I hear all these talks. Uh, you, you switch to a, a healthy diet with lots of different plants, lots of diverse fibers and colors. Uh, your microbiome is going to improve. And if you keep that up, if you keep that up for say 12 to 18 months, this is going to be your new normal. So now if you go to a conference and you have this, you know, junk food again, and you come home, you'll bounce right back to that new normal. What else we need to know is so we already alluded to this, uh, more diverse diets lead more diverse microbiota. And we know that 
this is a marker of a quote unquote healthy microbiome, more diverse microbiota to some point seems to be healthy. So if you are going to eat fast food, make sure you're also eating healthy diet too, because at least then we're getting a diversity of diet. Okay, what else do you do about the diet? So when we think about diet and unhealthiness, I think about the Western diet. And the Western diet is a high fat, high protein diet. And because of that, it has negative effects on the gut microbiome. We see a decrease in diversity. We see an increase in fat utilizing and protein utilizing bacteria. And what does that mean? A decrease in short chain fatty acid producing bacteria, because they're the ones that eat the fiber. And it's because there's not as much fiber in the diet for them to eat. Um, but understanding that a humans is really difficult. So we've looked at animal models. And if we look at animal models, we, um, like I slipped a slide here. Um, we see that a high fat diet is typically not healthy. M one of the main markers we're looking at here is a decrease in diversity. Uh, and we, let's say we, we had a high fat diet of palm oil. So we're going to see these outcomes of it's not good for the microbiome. But interestingly enough, if we have the same high fat diet with olive oil or even safflower oil, we don't see these effects. So healthy fat may actually be protective in a high fat diet. And this has been confirmed in a few trials in humans, um, particularly those that have IBD. So the type of fat matters. And um, when you talk about fat, we really want to think about a ratio. So a ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, make sure you're getting enough of these healthier fats that are typically uh, liquid at room temperature, or if you're having you know, animal sources are coming from grass-fed sources. And what else do we need to know about the microbiome? So I think this is a particularly helpful example. Uh, so we're gonna call this the gut microbiota pyramid. This is what you would want your diet to look like, you know, somewhat if you wanna feed your gut microbiome. You can see there are lots of plants here at the base and maybe some grains as well. And then maybe also some animal products that are a little bit healthier. And then maybe some other animal products and sugar that are not so great upon occasion. Uh, but it's pretty much the opposite of the Western diet. It's, it's, you, you flip the Western diet on its head, and that's what we want to see for microbiome health. And the key here is the fiber, as everyone has been talking about. So what about supplementing the fiber? So that's one way to add fiber to your diet. And uh, resistant starch is a type of prebiotic fiber. Uh, and if you deliver a prebiotic supplement containing resistant starch to people have just this one bug, Ruminococcus bromii. So they have this, this bug. They use 100% of that resistant starch. That, that bug digests it and it, it gets turned into certain fatty acids. But in people that don't have that bug, only 20 to 30% of that resistant starch is actually utilized. So just delivering a prebiotic supplement may not give you a, the effect you're looking for. And I like to explain this using this example. Let's say we have a patient that comes in with a green microbiome and you give them a prebiotic that has resistant starch and they have great outcomes. And you're like, this is great. I'm gonna use this for all my patients. But now you have a patient that has a purple microbiome and you give them the exact same supplement. Well, they have negative outcomes. Maybe they're having gas, cramping, bloating, diarrhea, or constipation. Well, that's not good. Okay, maybe it's just something weird about that patient. Uh, the next patient that comes in and they have an orange microbiome, you give them the same prebiotic fiber. Well, they have no response at all. And this might sound a little bit crazy, but I will tell you, this is exactly what happens with the gut microbiome because it's highly dependent on what their microbiome looks like, how they're gonna respond to any individual supplement. Uh, uh, and it makes it really difficult to study this, but also it makes it really difficult for a clinician to figure out what should I recommend for each patient? And right now it's difficult to answer that question, but hopefully in five or 10 years, we'll have a better understanding about what types of microbiomes go well with what supplements and how we can match them to Im improve their gut health. What else is there to diet? So there, we talked about macronutrients, carbs, fat, protein. We talked a little bit about um, prebiotic fiber, which is, it's technically a carb, but it's not one that we can digest. There are also these non-nutritive components of the diet, and they're polyphenols, and the one you've probably heard of is resveratrol, which is found in red wine, but these are basically plant chemicals, chemicals found in plants that have been linked to beneficial health effects, such as cancer prevention and heart disease. But what's really interesting about them is that we aren't digesting these polyphenols. About 90% of them actually make it to our gut microbiome. And the gut microbiome are the ones that process it and they improve the bioavailability so we can actually utilize those, those compounds. And so it's possible that we wouldn't be able to get the health benefits of a healthy diet without a healthy gut microbiome, or at least without a microbiome that has a enough 
microbes there that can help with this processing. And one example, and uh, I'm, this is not telling you to drink wine, but if you do drink wine, maybe this will feel you, make you feel a little bit better about it. Uh, so this study looked at uh, consumption of wine, consumption of dealkalized wine, and then consumption of gin as alcohol, and how that changed the microbiome. And the key that they found here was that you couldn't simply add the dealkalized gin and the gin together to see the effects of wine. It's actually synergistic. So the effect of wine was much larger than the effect of dealkalized and gin added together. And that is what we call the food matrix effect. And basically, uh, it's first of all, we don't eat nutrients, we eat foods, right? So people aren't eating portions of the wine, they aren't eating different nutrients of the wine, they're having the wine. Um, and, and the same is true of an apple, you can't simply take, you know, a glass of water, a fiber supplement, the macro and micronutrients that are found here on the nutrition facts label in this apple, and maybe some of the polyphenols like quercetin that are found in this apple, and think you're going to get the same effect as eating an apple. There's something unique and specific about how everything comes together in that apple. And this is part of the reason that whole foods are so important for your gut health. And while I fully support Chris's idea to like, let's have le or more healthy processed foods, Ultimately, the ideal would be to have whole foods, and this is why. Um, foods are not simply the sum of their parts. That doesn't mean we can't improve foods by adding things like fiber to them. It's just knowing that it's not going to be the same as having a whole food. And again, the reason why a diversity of diet is really important. But a lot of this work is not done in an ideal situation for research. So many of them is actually done in animal models. And while they're very convenient, unfortunately, they, they don't translate well to humans in general, but especially as we're talking about nutrition and the gut microbiome, they just really aren't translating well. So we need to establish these relationships in humans and then use the animal models for mechanistic studies. The other thing is small feeding studies. Uh, for instance, the ones by Kevin Hall, that, that was a great, robust, small feeding study. And they're very difficult to do, and they're actually quite expensive. Uh, and so that's part of the reason they're small. But the problem with having them being small in terms of the gut microbiome is you're having a limited sample size of individuals, which means you're having a limited sample size of different types of microbiomes, variety of subjects and variety of microbiomes. So it may not actually be generalizable to people outside that study. It's really only gonna to relate to those types of microbiomes that are in that study. Maybe in who knows, maybe you only have three different types of microbiomes in this group. Whereas in, you know, in the world, maybe there's 12 or 15 different kinds. And so generalizing that to everybody else is not simple. The other thing we do is supplementation studies. And as I've already told you, um, that doesn't always work because there's so much inter-individual variation. But the other big thing is that it may not actually represent what a dietary intervention would look like. Because again, we don't eat food, or we, we eat foods, not compounds, right? We're eating, we don't eat nutrients, we eat the foods they come in. And that food matrix is really important to the, to the response. So just looking at a supplemental version of say fiber is not going to necessarily have the same effect of increasing fiber in your dietary intake. Now, it may actually be better in the dietary intake. So, you know, there's something to looking at those studies, but we have to take them with a bit of a, an understanding. Okay, there's something on this slide that's just very highly controversial. I just want to put that out there. Food addiction may or may not be an appropriate term, um, but it is on this slide. <laughs> um, so obesity is actually, or may actually be, a, a disorder of the gut microbiome. And this slide brings the sort of the gut of that. So in a healthy gut microbiome, you've got a nice diverse microbiome, you've got a healthy mucus layer here, an intact gut barrier, and you're able to control your ingestive behavior through normal satiety mechanisms where the brain and the gut are talking to each other. And how does this happen? Well, it happens through complex carbohydrates, a high fiber diet. That fiber is then degraded by the microbiome, and we have things like short chain fatty acids, which are making sure our gut area is intact. Now, in cases of obesity or possibly food addiction, uh, we don't see that. We, the microbiome is not as healthy. It's not as diverse. They're starting to get into this mucus, mucus layer. They're actually degrading the mucus layer. And some of them are starting to get across the gut brain or the, the gut brain, uh, the gut barrier uh, because it's become leaky because it's this is a diet of refined carbohydrates and maybe sugar high fat, low fiber. So there's not enough fiber there for the gut microbiome to degrade and produce short chain fatty acids to feed these colonocytes. 
And so this is an unhealthy microbiome and an unhealthy microbiome makes it difficult for the brain and the gut to work together to control things like ingestive behavior. And so what do we see? We see metabolic endotoxemia. Uh, we see neuroinflammation. Whoop. We see compromised satiety mechanism. And really the, the key of that here is an imbalance between homeostatic and hedonic food intake. What does that mean? Homeostatic food intake is my body saying, I'm running low on, on fuel, I need more fuel. That's what we should be doing and we should be listening to our bodies when it tells us that. Hedonic is more liking and wanting, which we've all experienced. Like you, you ate a big meal, you're full, but then someone brings, you know, for me, it's flourless chocolate cake. They bring flourless chocolate cake out and I have a whole second stomach for that, right? I found room for it because I liked it and I wanted it. And a little bit of that is absolutely okay. But in this state, the body is basically running in that mechanism. It's it's so heavily dependent on hedonic that it becomes very difficult to have a healthy intake of food. And that's why we think perhaps food addiction may be an appropriate description for that would also add that the reason it's a driver of obesity is because the, the brain is basically being told by the gut that I'm starving. Uh, and so we need to get more food and it becomes really difficult to treat obesity unless you're going to try and treat this underlying um, disorder here. Uh, and for it, for in the animals in rodent models, we have a fix for this. We've got it down and we can cure a lot of things in animals that we can't cure in humans. And, and, uh, when we, we look at animal models of obesity, uh, their offspring have a decreased cognitive function and decreased social communication. That's one of the, the side effects of obesity in rodent models. Now, if we give them a high fiber diet, uh, oh, we fix that. It's so simple. It's all they needed was more fiber in their diet, which you know we know, short chain fatty acids. We've got the pathways. It makes sense to us, but it's not that simple in humans. And so let's look a little bit at the human research. Now, this is looking at supplements, not diet. So it's a little bit different. Um, in one study, a double-blind placebo-controlled study, which is kind of the gold standard, but it's only in 47 subjects, so it's a small number of microbiomes, uh, they gave one bug, Lactobacillus casei shirocha, in a fermented milk. So this wasn't just like a probiotic supplement, this is in a fermented food product. And they took it every day for eight weeks, which is a short period of time, right? We wouldn't expect, that's certainly not a long-term change for the microbiome. Uh, but we did see improved physical symptoms of stress and biomarkers like cortisol. So that's somewhat promising. Okay. And, and if we can do that in eight weeks, then maybe continuing it will actually improve those results. But we don't know that yet. In another study, also a randomized controlled trial, this one did not have a placebo and it had a smaller number of subjects. Uh, it had what we call a consortium of probiotics. So it has a number of different bugs here that are all supposed to work together. And again, this one was delivered in, as a fermented milk instead of just a probiotic pill. Now this was taken twice daily, but only for four weeks. So they're getting it more frequently, but only for a shorter period of time. And they used a bold fMRI scanner to look at midbrain connectivity and showed that they actually had improvements in midbrain connectivity within four weeks, which again is very promising. Now let's look at diet, because this is what really gets me excited. So here's a single group feeding study. So I already told you these are robust, but they're usually very small, 26 adults. So we don't have a lot of different microbiomes there. Here they used an inulin uh, type of fiber and through rich vegetables. So they looked at fructans rich vegetables and they had to have them every day for two weeks. Seems doable, add a little vegetables to your diet for two weeks, we can all do that. Uh, what they saw was increased satiety and reduced cravings. Now, what is that? That is the microbiome gut brain access in, in action, uh, right? It's That's that moving from the hedonic to the homeostatic wanting. Um, they did see a little bit of increased flatulence and transient changes in the microbiome comp composition. Now with the flatulence, one of my big arguments with fiber is that we wanna start low and go slow so we can avoid some of these side effects as your body gets used to it, your microbiome gets used to it, particularly if you're on a low fiber diet to start with. When your gut microbes see some fiber, they get real excited because they haven't seen it for a while. And so they they produce too much gas and, and too many short chain fatty acids at once and you can have some digestive upset. So you wanna uh, be careful with fiber. And then the transit changes, that's exactly what we'd expect because this is only two weeks, right? So as soon as you stop taking this, it's going to bounce back to whatever it was before. But perhaps if this was for 12 months, maybe we would see something that seemed more lasting. All right, another study here, a controlled intervention of... 44 women with obesity. So a small study, but they're a little more homogenous in the fact that they're all women who have obesity. And we looked over an eight-week period. 
They were given a, a 20 minute dietary lecture talking about healthy diet, fiber, fermented foods, all the good stuff we're talking about today. And then they also had a 10 minute RD counseling every two weeks. So they're talking with a, a registered dietitian uh, and getting help on improving their diet. And in this intervention, they saw improvements in BMI, waist circumference, depression, now that's microbiome, gut, brain axis, self-rated health, and microbiome diversity. So diet can move the needle even in only eight weeks, but we would like to see a longer term study to really see how this is affecting their microbiome, gut, brain axis. And finally, here's a study looking at a pre-post intervention of individuals that are not frail and individuals who are borderline frail. And this is a large study. So now we're starting to get a little bit more interest, right? 612 different people. There should be some different microbiomes in here. And what did they, they do? They gave, had them to use the Mediterranean diet, which is a very well-established evidence-based diet for 12 months. Okay, now I'm really getting excited, right? Now we're talking about long-term changes in the microbiome. Uh, what do they find? Dietary adherence. So how well they stuck to this Mediterranean diet, how well what they actually ate looked like a Mediterranean diet was associated with microbiome compositional changes, increased short chain fatty acids. So, you know, maybe reduced leaky gut probably if they had tested for that, decreased secondary bile acids and P-Cressel and other things that we don't want to have super high amounts of. But again, correlation is not causation. So this is just an association. And they also saw microbiome alterations associated with improvements in frailty, inflammation, and cognition. The cognition is the part that really gets me excited uh, because if we have a lifestyle intervention that can help support the brain with the microbiome gut brain axis, that's something that we don't really have a lot of other things that can do. Um, so more research is needed here, but I think this is very promising. So in summary, uh, all systems of the body are connected and they influence each other. Key tenant of integrative medicine. The gut microbiome is a powerful modifier of many systems, including the microbiome gut brain axis. And here you can see it's all connected. Your gut is talking through the vagal nerve to the brain. There's also the circulation and they're talking back and forth. And so if you want to help your brain, you should also look to your gut. Also, the diet can be used for temporary or long-term modulation of the gut microbiome and thus the microbiome gut brain axis. And that temporary being less than 12 months, long-term being on the order of at least 12 to 18 months. And then research is definitely needed in this area. So you know, this is not a done deal. And what are we looking for, particularly establishing these relationships clearly in humans? We need to make sure that the relationships are there in humans before we start trying to figure out the mechanism in animals. And then also we really need to develop protocols for implementation. Because um, as you saw in the studies that I just presented, they're kind of all over the place. Some of them are four weeks, some of them are eight weeks, some of them are six weeks. Some of them took it once a day, some of them took twice a day. Some of them were in fermented milk, some of them were just pills, some of them were diet. Um, so having a, a state standardized way for in implementing uh, microbiome gut brain access protocols uh, would really be helpful so we can compare them with each other, which right now we can't do. Um, we also can't compare with them because of the uh, measurement biases that, that Scott was talking about earlier. So lots to be done here, but it, I think it's very promising and I'm personally very excited about it. And then finally, I want to just put a little plug in for our podcast, the GW Integrative Medicine Podcast. Uh, you can find it anywhere you listen to your podcast or on our website. Uh, and if you like what you heard today at the Sung Symposium, I highly recommend you tune into this because we talk about very similar things on here, uh, but it's in under 30 minutes. So, you know, if you're commuting or you're going for a walk or a bike ride, you can pop in some earbuds and, and learn some integrative medicine. And with that... I am going to stop sharing and I'm going to introduce our mindful movement coordinator. So we're going to have a short break, a 10 minute break in which we're going to do a mindful movement ex exercise just to get our blood pumping again before we get to the panel discussion. And that is going to be led by Dr. Misha Kogan. Dr. Kogan, there he is. Yeah. How's my sound? How's my picture? Yep. Okay. Everything looks good. All it right. sounds good. Okay. All right. I, I need to see myself so that, okay, so that should work. Okay. So make sure you um, find a comfortable position to stand. You don't really need a lot of space for this. And the practice here is borrowed mostly from um, traditional Qigong. Sometimes it's called eight brocades. There are some other names for it. And we're not going to do the whole thing, which takes about 20 minutes, but we're going to do some parts of it. 
So for starters, what I want you to do is, um, if you're standing, and I'll explain what to do if you're sitting, uh, make sure that your knees are slightly relaxed and they're not fully straight, so you don't lock them. Unlock the knees, which means you're gonna come down just a little bit. Tuck your pelvis like this a little bit up front, just again, very slightly. And then relax your shoulders, so you may wanna roll them once back so that your hands are fully relaxed. And this is the beginning position. And the first uh, first set we will do, we're gonna take a deep breath. We're gonna raise our hand, inhale. When you come to the top, you're gonna cross interlock your fingers like this, and then you're gonna exhale and calm down a little bit. So you're gonna sit down a little more. Then you're gonna inhale and you're gonna reverse your hands and you're gonna look up and stretch. And then you're going to revert back and you're gonna exhale and sit down. And so we'll do this for a few more movements. Inhale up, stretch. And then exhale and relax back. And again. And exhale. One more time. And exhale. And then slowly bring your hands down. Shake your hands a little bit if they're a little tired. And then we'll start the next one. So the next one starts from here. You bring your hands at the level of your chest. And the right hand's gonna go up. And it's gonna go up with your fingers pointing to the left. And the left will come down with the fingers pointing forward. Again, relax everything. Relax the knees, relax the shoulders. And, and when you get to this point, you're going to lean to the left just a little bit to stretch. And then you're going to come back. Um, maybe a street noise, apologies. So, and then we'll switch. Inhale to the other side, lean, slowly stretch in the left side and now come back. And so we're going to keep going, alternating from one side to another. Inhale and stretch. And exhale and relax in the middle. When you're stretching, use your own judgment, what's comfortable. So for me, it's somewhere around right here. And you want to feel a good stretch on the ribs and also probably at the hip level but make sure you don't overstretch. Now, I forgot to mention, if you're sitting, you can do all of this movement sitting. Um, you will need to accommodate adjust accordingly when you're sitting, but this first movements are all can be done sitting. This side again, left. And exhale. Check in with your knees to make sure they're not locked. If you lock your knees, the energy changes the way it flows. And we'll do one more movement on each side. And come and do the other side. Okay. So the next one, your feet a little wider. So again, if you're sitting, just open your open your feet. Um, if you can sit down a little bit lower, if you've done martial arts and your upper legs are strong, that's fine. Otherwise, just come up a little bit more, but make sure that the knees are not locked. And this is a bow and arrow exercise. So starting from the same position as the last one, our right hand is gonna be the string and the left is gonna be the bow. And we're gonna turn and we're gonna open the chest and stretch, looking to the left. Uh, this uh, left, the way the fingers are, you have a finger upside, and then this one's you keep closing. It's actually not as important if you're not doing that right, it's okay, as long as you're stretching your chest. So this is inhale and then release, bring back and now switch. So now the left becomes the string, the right becomes the bow. Inhale, stretch, open the chest, and then exhale. When you're finishing the inhale, your hands should be on the same line, roughly, fully opening the chest. So, of course, this exercise helps you with the shoulders. 
helps you with the chest. And the breathing should be fully synced with each movement. And that means you may be doing this a little faster or a little slower than me on each side. So make sure you're not struggling for breath, but yet that it is slow enough for you. In fact, you may be slowing the movements gradually as you get more accustomed to the practice. I'm gonna do a few movements silently here. And then let's do one more cycle. And the left. And then bring your hands slowly down and then come up and we're gonna do the next one. So the next one, if you sit it, you're going to bend forward despite being in the seated position. If you're standing, so I'm gonna show you first. So hands gonna come up without interlocking. And then we're going to slowly bend forward if you don't have to worry about touching the ground, what you wanna do if you are having a hard time reaching the ground, bend your knees more, and then bring your fingers to touch the toes. And then when you inhale, you're gonna gradually bring the hands up. When they reach the hips, you're going to start raising them continuously, inhaling. And if you can, only if you can, when you finish the inhalation, you're gonna come up on your toes, finish it right here with the inhale, and then begin to exhale, slowly bending forward. And then follow your own breath. Inhale, come up. Head comes up last. Raise and stand on your toes if you can. If you sit in, of course, it's easier to do so. Inhale. This is very good for balance especially if you get to a point where when you're standing on top, you can try to close your eyes for a few seconds. In the beginning, you probably don't want to. Inhale. And we'll do one more. Traditionally, we do each one eight times. I think we're probably doing a little bit less than that just because we don't have 20, 25 minutes. Exhale, slowly come down. Lee, how much time we have? Uh, you have about seven more minutes if you want it. Oh, wow. So or you can give us more time and... for the uh, panel. Uh, well, how do people feel? I mean, we can stop right here. We can do a couple more, whatever. I feel like I'm stretched well. It Maybe like one more, let's least. do one more. Let's do one more. This one is a bit more energetic, so it's kind of very uplifting. So I think that's a good one for the conversation. So um, this one fit also a little bit wider, but not as wide as the one when we did the bow and arrow. And here it's a, it looks more martial. So we bring the hands to the hips. Uh, we do gently close the hands, but you know you don't forcefully form the fist, they just kind of bring the fingers together and keep it relaxed. And then the movement goes like this, I'm gonna show you first. So you, we exhale, and then we come down to this end of a quote unquote energy, quote unquote energy punch. You literally as if you're grabbing the energy here and then bringing back into your, uh, to, to the hip. And then the other side, so exhale, grab, inhale and then turn to the right and do the same. So exhale, grab, bring to the hips, and then the other side. So this is one cycle we just did. So let's do maybe, let's do maybe four cycles of this, so three more. So exhale, grab, inhale. Make sure you don't like your knees. One of the most important principles. If you have to remember to not do that, not to like the knees, you may want to sit down just a little bit lower. And the movements are equal. Is the punch and bring back is about the same speed. 
this one is not as much as stretching as really sensing this energetic component of kind of a grabbing the energy that's out there, bringing it to the body. And if you need a bit more instructions here, you take this to the kind of next level. You can think of when you punching, kind of punch out of your dantian, out of your bell area, right under your belly button. And then when you bring it back, you're kind of dragging the energy back in there. So it's like you're, you're moving your energy out and back in. And if you feel anything, um, well, I wouldn't say shaking, you may feel a little bit of a kind of a tingling sensations, but this are all normal, it's actually good. Maybe you start feeling temperature change, increased heat. Maybe you feel more relaxed or just kind of a more grounded. So those are the good things. Okay, so let's do last cycle. I forgot to count. I'm not sure where we are. That's okay. If you're breathing nose to nose, it's fine. If you're exhaling through the mouth, that's also fine. And we're going to close. So the way we're going to close, we're going to bring our feet almost touching, lower our hands. We're going to inhale, gently look up, and gather the energy that's collected, and then exhale down. And then two more times, inhale up. And lower the hands. This is called gathering the clouds. Cloud energy. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Hope you feel a little bit more energized, a little stretched. And, and um, I'm glad I enjoyed the time outside with you. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. And I'm jealous of you getting to go outside. Hopefully we will all get to go outside later. So I will welcome all of our speakers back, our panelists back for this panel discussion, which I think is going to be a good one. And we have quite a number of questions. We have 14 questions lined up. So I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but we will certainly do our best. The first one, Scott, we're gonna start with you, but then I'll open it up to Yvonne and Chris as well. Um, direct to consumer fecal testing is variable, as you described, but what about results from a medical professional to a patient? Are there, are there highly controlled clinical microbiome tests at this point? No, no, uh, you know, again, it goes back to the methodological variability and I can comfortably say that every microbiome measurement that's ever been done is wrong. It's inaccurate. The saving grace in all of the space is that they're precise, they're reproducible. So differences that you see are real. So if you look at cohort of vegans versus omnivores, you see differences, those differences are real. You might be measuring them wrong individually, but the relative differences are real. So the reports you get from your microbiome analysis typically show where you are relative to a cohort or a population, you know, a, a self reported healthy population. So, you know, here's the cluster of healthy people and you're right here, you know. So that's about the best we can do right now. And even if you could do absolutely accurate measurements of the microbiome, it, there's no way to really interpret that. It, it is all relative based on like, where are you in a healthy versus disease cohort? That's about the best we can do right now. Professor Yvonne? Yeah, I, I, I am, and I, I um, completely agree. I, I, I also think um, you know, there, there are a couple of companies out there that have linked those relative differences to things like blood sugar. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if there are any, and, and I say that with a question, uh, companies that are doing this um, in a meaningful way that provides guidance clinically, it would possibly be those companies uh, because what you do is you send in a stool sample, they perform an analysis of it. They know that certain types of uh, microbes and uh, genes are associated with certain responses to foods. And so they can tell you, well, you can eat this food and you'll respond just fine, but you, don't eat this food because it's going to spike your blood sugar. 
that's actually been studied pretty well and it seems to be pretty predictive. Um, it's just not everyone needs their blood sugar controlled like that. That's more relevant for folks that have diabetes. Um, if you just wanna know what your microbiome is, you could do that for kicks and giggles. It's just not gonna be terribly helpful. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and to add to that, I think um, Scott and Chris have summarized this beautifully. Um, it's the, the it's the equivalent of asking if we have true north measurements of the microbiome, which, um, you know, Scott's earlier presentation covered this really well. We do not, right? We we can't accurately say that what we are seeing in a fecal sample is an accurate rep full accurate representation of what is inside of your body, right? That's a very difficult uh, assumption to jump to your conclusion to jump to. However, uh, there are ways to control the process and the measurements, which is what Scott's group is working on heavily. Um, I do as part of my job as well. A lot of it has to do with making sure we're standardizing the collection method, the storage method, the transportation, the actual processing of the sample, and making sure that the data analysis we perform is reproducible, right? Even if we don't have a true north accurate representation, we can at least make sure that we are measuring the same thing the same way every single time. And so once we do arrive at that point, uh, if a company or individual group is able to do this, it can take this to FDA, go through kind of like a, you know, a de novo pathway, get a full kind of path or a full kit approved pretty much. And we do have a kit approved for collecting and storing fecal samples for microbiome analysis by the FDA using this pathway, but the actual downstream analysis portion is still lacking these tools. So it will take some time to get there, but I think we are working towards that. Wonderful. The only thing I have to add is something that I say to my students all the time. Would the test change what you were going to tell them to do? Right. If you were going to tell them to, you know, have mostly whole foods, increase their fiber intake, get more physical activity, regardless of what the microbiome test says, then do you really need a clinical microbiome test? I would argue probably not, at least not at this point, because we just don't know enough to get any more granular than that anyway. So wonderful. Right. Thank you all. Francis Collins, the NIH director, of course, had a great saying. He was asked a question during a seminar. Uh, a, a, a person asked, should I, should I get my genome sequenced? And, and uh, Francis Collins' response was, use that money to join a gym. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great response. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, same thing. You save your microbiome money and, and use it for buying healthier food and, and yeah, doing some physical activity. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the next question, I'm, I'm going to have Yvonne start with this one. And I think Scott might also have some thoughts. Is diversity modified with age when evaluated with shotgun metagenomics or other more advanced methods, i.e. transcriptomics, as well as the more typical 16S metagenomics? Basically, is there a difference with these new techniques? So we do, we do see um, that we see increasing amounts of information collected basically with the different methods, right? 16S, you're really just at the surface and then you begin to dig in with metagenomic shotgun and you're getting more information, more data than you add metatranscriptomics and, and um, meta basically just a lot of information that coming through, right? And so I will say that that um, increasing diversity over the lifespan, especially within the first, I wanna say 20, well, about 15 years of life really. By age one, as I mentioned, your microbiome is, is fully pretty much established, right? But that diversity can go up based on diet. It can also go down. Right. Let's acknowledge that again, as as Lee has covered in her lovely presentation. So I think that um, regardless of the method that we use, all of these studies have the same conclusion. Diversity does change based on the age, but a lot of it is actually dependent on diet and lifestyle. And um, maybe Scott or Chris want to add something? Lee, you cut out when you were asking the question, but I just think it's whole genome shotgun versus 16S analysis. In the well, and also, uh, you know, other methods like transcriptomics. Are we are we seeing a different picture with them? I will say that uh, a different picture in terms of, I guess, just the type of information being collected, right? Um, so I think that's maybe that's what the question is about. Are we getting a different type of information collected? Yes. But in terms of the actual core question of if the diversity itself is being modified 
over your lifespan. Yes, we still see that play out regardless of the technique you're using to collect that information. So if I were, if I was um, looking at just, uh, for example, 16S, right, we can answer that question, just look at genera or like a genus, um, maybe species level, probably not um, with high reliability accuracy, but at least genus level, I can say that, you know, these genera, these phyla are affected this way over the person's lifespan. And, re and, and I think I see a chat said regarding mm -hmm. diversity specifically. Yeah, so he's asking regarding diversity specifically if we see that pattern play out regardless of the method. And I think, yes, we, we do, based on what I have seen, we do see that regardless of what method or technique is being used to collect the data. That is what the data suggests. Yeah, that, that, that sounds right on. And what I might add is, um, the taxonomic or you know the players that are there is going to be you know more or less similar the functional uh, piece which metagenomics and transcriptomics is getting at um what's really interesting is the diversity as you get older gets greater and greater but the functional piece actually maintains more constancy and, and that's because the functional part of our genes is incredibly redundant. So you're getting more and more players that have those same types of genes. Uh, and that's what the metagenomics and the um, transcriptomics is capturing is that functional part. Like what, what are those bugs actually doing there? Um, you know, what does that mean? How does that you know, reduce down to practical implications of how we live our lives? I, I don't know, but it's, it's an interesting finding. Mm. Yeah, and to add to that from a microbial ecology perspective, right, if we look at the gut microbiome just as an ecological mm -hmm. community and we think about each of the different groups of microbes we see there, we'll see as just a functional entity, right, feeling as filling a specific ecological niche, right, typically what, what we see is that there's just like Chris mentioned, there's redundancy built in there. So there's multiple groups of microbes that perform exactly the same function. So short chain fatty acid pr producers like butyric producers uh, belong to multiple genera. It isn't just limited to one specific organism. So even if that organism is lost in the microbiome early in life, mm -hmm. there is another one that fills that ecological niche. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we covered that one. Next question is a simple question, but I don't think it has a simple answer. Does a quality probiotic need refrigeration? <laughs> Who wants to tackle that one? Uh, well, remember that foods are also categorized as probiotics, fermented foods. So, you know, are you talking about kimchi? Are you talking about yogurt, uh, sauerkraut? Or are you talking about the bottles of pills that you buy from CVS? I think they're probably talking about the bottles, but I think you're you're fair to include kimchi and yogurt and all that in there. Uh, so, so from a you know a, a manufacturing technical perspective, they are required to write the number of viable bacteria on the side of the bottle, and it's usually like ten to the ninth vi live cultures or something. They have a weird terminology, but basically it's it's colony forming units. And what the manufacturers do is safety. If they say it's 10 to the ninth, it has to be 10 to the ninth, two years out. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll do an overage, like an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude over so that when two years comes along, it's, it's been reduced, but now it's back to 10 to the ninth. And that's um, for wh what it's worth. It's just how they handle that. Because yes, the bacteria will die uh, slowly over time for refrigeration will probably slow that down. But, um, you know, we're talking about logs, you know, orders of magnitude of, of colony forming units here. So, you know, a twofold decrease is, is insignificant in the, in the scale of 10 to the ninth. That's brilliant. And what I might add is um, there's some really fascinating research uh, that's been published in the last, you know, five plus years that looks at uh, live bacteria uh, versus killed bacteria, live inactivated bacteria. Um, I think, you know, there's one study done for acromancia in particular um, in metabolic uh, disease. And if I recall, there wasn't a difference for that particular study and outcomes, which says that it's the preformed components 
of that acromancia that was responsible for what the effect was. Now, I don't think that categorically is the case across all probiotics. It really depends on A, the specific probiotic. And I think this was your point, Scott, earlier, uh, and B, the specific indication. So we can't say categorically that you need live bugs or dead bugs, but that possibility that dead bugs work and data that supports dead bug work, dead, dead bugs work, I find intriguing. Yeah, and some of the interesting thing about that is, is it the dead bugs or what comes with the dead bugs, right? The postbiotics, is that what's yes. actually yeah. working? Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I actually omitted myself to say what Chris said, so I'm just not <laughs> say more. You summarized it really well. <laughs> yeah, you did summarize that really well, Chris. Actually, the next question is for you as well, Chris, um, but I think we'll all have thoughts on it. Is regular use of a prescription and acid a concern for the gut and its microbes? PPIs. Do you want me to go first or? Yes, please. <laughs> okay. Start you with know, the, the gastro. <laughs> there, there's, there's a ton of research coming out on PPIs and, and how maybe we shouldn't be adding them to the water like fluoride um, and prescribing them, um, you know, so, um, so readily as gastroenterologists and as, uh, internists, et cetera. Um, part of that research is actually around the microbiome, uh, and the impact that antacids have on the microbiome that truly just about any medication that you take has been shown even, um, you know, um, drugs for depression or for psychosis uh, have been shown to impact the microbiome. But yes, you know, acid suppression medications do as well for better or for worse. And anytime you prescribe a drug, it's a risk benefit analysis. And in some cases, PPIs, um, you know, have incredible improvement on quality of life for people and, and, and they're valuable. Um, yes, knowing that there are these side effects. Um, but the answer is, yeah, like they can impact microbiome uh, by decreasing acid or having direct effects um, lower on in the gut. That's an application that we've discussed for our NIST standardized fecal material that you could use it to do some in vitro drug interaction studies. You know, you mm -hmm. add a PPI to an in vitro, you know, fecal sample and, and let it go and see what happens as sort of a, you know, an in vitro model system to understand that those processes and the, the fact that it's standardized and we can distribute it across the country means that people can reproduce those across laboratories. So I just see a comment in the, the chat from one of my faculty members reading my mind. So Mark Webster, uh, he says, PPIs are my least favorite drugs because they also impact nutrient absorption as well as reduce the acid that would normally kill oral bugs that enter the stomach. And I would say the nutrient absorption is, is a concern that I have as well, um, particularly for magnesium, which most people don't get enough of it already. So now we're layering that on top of this. And I think that is often not included in the cost benefit analysis when we're thinking about these drugs. And so doing a more holistic examin examination of that cost benefit analysis might shift how many people are getting these drugs. And this may in truth be part of the mechanism behind the bone density um, findings that are seen, you know, impact in divalent cations, specifically calcium. Um, and other divalent cations that actually help uh, in calcium absorption. Um, along the lines of fiber though, um, I think a story that we'll see developing in the future, and there's already some evidence to support this, is fiber is not relevant just to lower gut. Um, and it may or may not be through a microbiome mechanism uh, that it impacts um, things like um, not the actual reflux uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease, but how the esophagus experiences that reflux, whether the barrier is broken, whether those nerve endings are potentiated and inflamed and, you know, scream when they feel that acid. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there's even commercial products out there um, that have evidence behind them, I think out of Stanford, um, that show an improvement in heartburn symptoms. And I, I it would be great. I'd love it if we could replace PPIs for all the reasons that you just mentioned, Lee, with, with these uh, new fiber-based and whole food approaches. I have Amen a, to uh, that. 
Yeah, I have a family history of acid reflux and I used to take PPIs and, and needed to because of acid reflux. But through some lifestyle changes, I was able to stop and, and I don't have acid reflux. So it's certainly something I think you can manage without PPIs. That's the goal. So here's a question I feel like I get all the time. Can probi probiotic food be more beneficial or as beneficial as probiotic supplements? And who wants to start with that one? Okay, I'm going to start actually. I'm going to, I'm going to take moderator privilege. Um, so I think the main difference between probiotic foods and probiotic supplements is that probiotic foods are bringing so much else along with them, right? They have all these like things coming to the party with them, the prebiotic fibers, the non prebiotic fibers, um, nutrients, uh, the food matrix effect. Uh, there's probably some sort of consortia in that prebiotic food that maybe is not going to be present in a supplement. So my bias is that there's a, our body co-evolved with these fermented foods. And so there's probably a real benefit to having them in our life. That being said, the supplements are really helpful for precision and, and targeted interventions. And so I see that being their strength, but I don't know if we're really there yet. You know, the health benefits of probiotics go back to fermented foods, right? You know, humans have been eating fermented foods for millennia. So this idea that you could take the microbes out of those fermented foods and it would have the same beneficial effect is kind of ridiculous to think mm -hmm. about. Um, there was a study done by a, a German group a few years ago, and they looked at 300 healthy individuals. And what they were looking for specifically is the presence of common probiotic strains in these healthy people who don't take probiotic supplements and they didn't find any. So mm -hmm. it seemed to demonstrate you don't need these probiotic strains to have a healthy, uh, to be healthy. Yeah. Or perhaps I, they're I, transitory because, you know, they didn't engraft. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. I was going to add to that and say, you know, uh, really spot on with both Lee and Scott's response. Um, you, the food that you're taking is, is not just the bug itself. Some of them don't even have live, uh, you know, versions of the organisms that fermented the food. Some of them just have the remnants of that fermentation in it. And so when we take the, the bug alone by itself in the supplements, we're, all, we're hoping that we can provide it with exactly the same conditions and exactly the same um, kind of substrate it needs in order to produce these beneficial um, byproducts that are present in the food in your body. And that's not necessarily what happens all the time, right? So um, I think really, again, this just points, points out that um, the reductionist approach to, to healthcare is not necessarily fully beneficial all the time. Again, it, it can be very helpful for targeted precision. Um, so for example, you know you've had a health intervention that has really, really um, impacted your microbiome stability. And so you might want to take, you know, some strains along with some dietary modifications to make sure those strains can then engraft because maybe you lost them through into antibiotic consumption, right? Um, those are the types of things that then it, it makes sense. But on a routine basis, obviously, uh, we're not we're not doctors. We can't give you medical advice, except for Chris. He can, but he's not your doctor, right? So <laughs> I don't know that he can either. Uh, but really important to note then that we, we are back to the whole foods, right? So just eat the whole foods, I think. Um, if you need the probiotics on top of that, obviously go for it. But um, really important to that, just emphasize the need to, to have the whole food itself. So the fermented food is definitely getting the top food from this panel. The, the really cool thing about fermented foods, um, there's a study that was published out of Stanford, out of Justin's group, actually, Justin Sonnenberg. I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago now. And uh, he showed that uh, increasing fermented foods in individuals increases diversity in their gut. And you think, okay, well, you know, that makes sense. You know, fermented foods, lots of new bugs. What's crazy though, and counterintuitive, is the increase in diversity um, was not from the bacteria that was in those foods. So those foods, those fermented foods were like serving as a, almost like a prebiotic. They were promoting the growth of bugs that were probably already in the gut, just underrepresented. Um, so super interesting. And so, so on target, everyone like fermented foods, fermented foods over, over probiotics. 
albeit if people have um, a devastated gut microbiome, like a bleach coral reef, if you can imagine that sort of vivid image versus like, you know, an aquarium type reef, um, it's going to be really hard even with fermented foods to restore that. And so, you know, new therapeutics companies working on these approaches of using not probiotic food-based therapies, but the ones that actually are normally present in our gut to try to repopulate that. I think, I think that type of approach for folks that have like true dysbiosis, true imbalance, um, is super promising. The folks that, you know, maybe normally can't have whole foods because their normal metabolic capacity is just devastated. It's not there anymore. Very important point. So related to that, and Chris, we'll start with you on this one. Are prebiotics necessary for GI health versus probiotics alone? I think we already touched on that, but I feel like the necessary for GI health is important. And then a follow-up question, what fiber is best for GI health? Yeah. Um, Prebiotics are great for gut health. It's more than just fiber. It's the 4S fiber, um, phenols, uh, ferments and good fats, I guess phonetic Fs uh, because of the pH uh, cheat. Um, And then the second uh, part of the question was... What fiber is best for GI health? What what fiber? Um, (laughs) Diversity. So if if you go for just this... (laughs) Yeah, all of them. You go for a single fiber, um, you're very likely to miss the mark uh, and you're only going to grow one type of bug because of that one-to-one relationship in the primary degraders. Um, so if you're doing a supplement, it's good to have a supplement that has diversity, but even better is to go for whole foods that inherently has that diversity built in. Agreed. And go ahead. Uh, yeah. The, uh, you know, the idea that probiotics are just sort of a marketing scheme to try to sell something that they can convince you is, is healthy for you because we've eaten them for millennia in fermented foods. Um, I think we're about to see that again with with prebiotics, which are fiber supplements. Oh, there's this new thing out there, prebiotics, and they're demonstrated to be healthy. These are also known as fiber supplements and they've been sold for, you know, a hundred years now. So it's, it's just a new way to market something that's been around forever. I think that's a fair point. I'm going to move on to the next question, which is directed towards me. Uh, does drinking bone broth play a role in a healthy gut microbiome? I'm going to use this as an opportunity to discuss how the microbiome and food relate to them to each other. So when you digest a food, a large portion of that food is typically taken by you. You're like, hey, this is mine between the stomach and the small intestine. You absorb most of it. And so what the microbiome actually sees is what's left over. And what is typically left over is fiber, the things that are not digestible to us, resistant starch, things like that. Um, Some amount of protein, which is going to vary based on your diet. So if you have a high protein diet, a lot of protein will make it to your gut microbiome. If you have a low protein diet, less protein will make it to your gut microbiome. And there shouldn't be much fat there if you have a healthy functioning gut and no uh, malabsorption. And so if you're having something like bone broth, which is really minerals, vitamins, some fat, some amino acids, uh, that's highly digestible. And so what happens is once it gets to your stomach and your small intestine, poof, it's all gone. There's nothing left, right? So it's going directly to you. And that's part of the reason people actually promote bone broth for health because it is highly digestible. So even if you have a gut that's not maybe super functional, you can absorb the nutrients from that bone broth. But that means there's nothing left for the gut microbes. And so it's not for them, it's for you. Uh, We actually just had a a post about this with my students in nutritional immunology, um, talking about fiber is really more for the microbiome than it is for you, but you need it because you need your microbiome. So let's take care of them. Uh, Any other thoughts on that? Just one other thought. I've, I've become really intrigued by potassium recently and the relation to potassium, the sodium potassium ratio. Um, and um, most of potassium is absorbed 90%, but there is a small fraction that makes it down. I don't know about sodium. I'd have to look that up. You know, um, yes. But uh, as you're talking, it, it's kind of sparking this, all right, got to go Google it now, which is kind of my modus operandi. I'm always... Always collecting questions, so thank you. 
Yeah, that's a good question. It's, and I think, so in the nutrition world, historically, we thought about digestion as stopping before the colon. And yeah. that digestion was just like where water got absorbed. And I think now that we understand the microbiome better, we realize that's probably not 100% accurate, but it hasn't been really well studied. So I don't even know if we know the answers to that quite yet. Mm. So much yeah. research to be done. And I do see something in the comments about honey related to the discussion on 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 fiber. So honey is a pretty rich source of a lot of these different complex uh, oligos, you know, um, carbs. So these are the the fibers are complex carbohydrates. So there are some studies in animal models, in culture models, in the lab suggesting it has prebiotic effects. Not that many in human, and honestly, the ones in humans have not confirmed this. <laughs> so, I mean, again, I, I don't know that it has, a, if it doesn't have a detrimental effect on your health, you know, um, why not? But again, we're not here to give specific advice either way, just to share what the scientific um, evidence suggests. And so that's, that's kind of the status of honey at this point, unknown to be determined. I'm glad you picked up on that one because that's like a little pet project for me and for uh, Misha Kogan. Uh, we're big fans of honey. And there is some human research indicating that um, small amounts of honey in the diet can actually improve your blood glucose control, which seems counterintuitive, right? You're adding sugar to the diet, but there's, honey is so much more than sugar. And if you're only having like a teaspoon a day of honey, it's not a lot of sugar, but you're adding other things in. Um, and one of the things that I like to think about honey, you know, if it's raw and unfiltered, it's almost like a B FMT, right? It's almost like I'm getting some of the B fecal microbiome and <laughs> transplanted into me. Um, no science behind that, right? Th that's just my surmising. Um, but I think that someone should do some honey studies. And actually, Dr. Kogan and I had tried to do a honey study, but we had didn't get funded. So maybe in the future. That sounds really cool, though. You could look at the, <laughs> the fecal microbiome of the honey and relate it, of the bees themselves related to the honey they produce and see if you're actually doing a BFMT when you take honey. Pretty compelling, actually. <laughs> I think it's fascinating personally. Another thing I think that is very fascinating is intermittent fasting. And there's a question here about uh, the evidence for that to reset the gut microbiome, which I think is a very specific question about how intermittent fasting might affect the gut microbiome. Who wants to take that one? <laughs> it came in during your talk, Chris. Okay. Um, so generally speaking, timing of eating I think will be an increasing theme uh, in metabolic control. Uh, intermittent fasting is part of it. Not snacking between meals is part of it. Um, the food that we eat is translated by the microbiome into signals that entrain our circadian rhythms almost as strongly as light cycles do. And when you travel uh, and want to avoid jet lag, uh, some of the best advice is to time your meals accordingly to the new time zone that you're going to, uh, to help in that transition. So, um, yes, I, I think it's the timing is, is very important uh, for circadian rhythms and circadian rhythms. Furthermore, um, at least in animal model studies with all the caveats that we talked about, um, has been tied to. Uh, good metabolism and dysfunction metabolism when that circadian rhythm is disrupted. In other words, independent of increase in um, calorie intake, there may be a propensity uh, for uh, fat deposition and dysregulation in general um, if the timing of your meals isn't appropriate. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. There's a whole field called chrononutrition uh, mm -hmm. about the importance of eating at certain times. And uh, just for those at home, quick hack, if it's light out, you can eat. If it's dark out, don't eat, right? It's, it's very simple. <laughs> like um, that's what the human body is used to and it helps with things like sleep. And it's just, that's a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and probably there's some sort of evolutionary biology behind that. Um, and we've seen, you know, there's been some studies looking at melatonin and, and other markers that if you eat at times, you know, too late into the evening, your melatonin production is not what it needs to be. So you're not going to sleep as well. And then you aren't going to feel great. So these are all little small things you can do to hopefully improve your already good health. 
Yeah, just to add a little bit on the literature end of things with fasting. Um, so some, uh, so some of the literature suggests, you know, there is some reshaping and that, that microbiome occurring with fasting, but it's important uh, to note all of the disclaimers that everyone on this panel has shared with these studies before, but also to point out that these were extended period fast. And so intermittent fasting is typically, you know, sun up, sun down type fasting or 16 hours fasting, 16 on, eight hours eating, or 18, six, and that type of variation. Um, very few of those studies have been done. So most of the studies are extended period fast of like three days or five days or whatever. And one of the really great ones uh, came out of Germany just uh, last, I think, 2021. And they were looking at a hypertensive population and, and, and showing that a five-day fast actually reset their gut microbiome and, and, and showed uh, some pretty great beneficial effects there. Um, so, you know, it could be working through modulating the gut microbiome, you know, in terms of said fasting or fasting in general, but we, we definitely need more information on it, I think, more research. Great, thank you. All right, the next two questions are for you, Scott. Uh, the one is a quick technical question which, um, oh, and of course he's coughing, <laughs> which you will have no problem answering quickly. And then the other one's a little more complicated. So the first question is, when diluting fecal sample with water, do you use standard sterile tap water or something special? Uh, just uh, high grade molecular biology grade H2O, the, the, the higher percent H2O, the better. <laughs> Super pure. Super pure. Great. Um, the next one is also related to your your sample choices. They they wanted to know why you chose vegan versus omnivore for your fecal standard cohort. Um, and one proposed option was why not whole foods plant-based? Mm -hmm. And then um, related to that, uh, do you standardize samples according to area of the country, demographics like ethnicity or type of diet? Yeah, those are, those are good questions. And we get asked that a lot. And I, I it sounds ugly to say this, but we don't really care about the vegan and omnivore diets and their impact. We just wanted fecal standards that were different. Something that we could say that this one is very different than this one because it allows you to show and demonstrate uh, what we call uh, pseudo quantitative differences. So I can't tell you what the level of E. coli is accurately in this one or this one, but I can tell you their relative difference. So it allows you to show quantitative relative um measurements by having different material different uh compositions of materials we we decided on the the diets because we um we theorized that they would have the largest impact on the fecal content uh that that's why we chose that um the second part of that question is within the cohorts yes we we age and demographically match them the best we can um, they were all self-identified as healthy and, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, and they you wanna... were also screened for infectious diseases, hepatitis, HIV, things like that, because we don't want our stakeholders working with fecal material that has, you know, infectious HIV in it, of course. So they were screened as healthy from infectious disease uh, perspective as well. Thank you. Yvonne, this question is, I don't think this is an easy one, but maybe I'm wrong. Do we know which organism or organisms in the gut make serotonin? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So not an easy question to answer. We, we, we have some ideas on which um, microbial groups or which bacterial groups are more likely to make serotonin. Is. So that's the best way we can answer it because we're doing this based on, you know, predictive Gene and, uh, genetic uh, sequencing and all of that. And, and that's challenging to demonstrate like in a very, very direct way, especially inside of, of, of a body. But there have been some animal studies trying to take that genetic information to prove that these are the specific organisms that make serotonin. So there are some that are suspected, but at, at this point, I will say it's still really early um, and, hard to be confident that those are the true north answers you know they're exactly right i think we have to take all of that with a grain of salt at this point and then um wait for more research to come up yes agreed that makes sense to me all right next question this came in during your talk yvonne but i think anyone can see if they've heard about this 
Have there been any studies that you are aware of using FMT for infants born via C-section after delivery from their mothers? I can't think of any. I can't either. Now I'm 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 like Chris. I Google everything. Now I'm gonna have to go search PubMed and <laughs> see if I can find something. Oh, clinical trial database. <laughs> yeah, Scott, did you see that when you were looking at the clinical trials database? What was the question again? Um, infants born via C-section. Are they using FMTs to try and improve their gut microbiome because they were born via C-section? No, they wouldn't do that to an infant because of the risks associated with it. Um, there are uh, probiotic strains, uh, namely Bifidobacter, Bifidobacterium uh, longum, also known as baby biff, and that has been uh, used and approved for neonates uh, because it's known to uh, be beneficial to infants, namely through um, human milk um, energy absorption. We FMTs are, are risky. FMTs are risky, and you don't yeah. want to use them willy nilly. So, I did find a one Nature paper actually <laughs> a couple years <laughs> ago. Um, they they use the mother's uh, fecal material, so just to uh, improve that initial seeding of the infant's gut. And I think they they took it directly from the mother and gave it. it was just a proof of concept, though, yeah. which basically means it was a very small um, set of babies. The, 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 Yvonne, the, your the, comment, uh, um, oh. Rob Knight's book, Follow Your Gut, he taught, Rob Knight is a leader in the field, and in his book, he talks about his wife giving birth via C-section, and he inoculated his baby in the, you know, in the delivery Oh, room. he did the FMT. <laughs> of course he, he did. did. <laughs> yeah, and he said the nurses and doctors were looking at him like he was crazy, and he was trying <laughs> to explain to him what they were, what he was doing. <laughs> so, But that was with a vaginal swab, right? He was using vaginal swabs, yes. Yeah, which is a little bit less risky in theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this this one is done orally, so it's interesting. They took the poop from the moms and uh, <laughs> mixed it up and gave it to the babies orally. Yeah. And what year was this in? It was like 20, 2020. Okay, so there could they, be follow-up coming. Yeah, yeah they, did, they, they just showed data for three months of follow-up. Interesting. No adverse events reported, so. I've heard um, conflicting reports, uh, different uh, papers that uh, support C-section is a different microbiome uh, versus vaginal birth. Um, in the latest report that I saw, um, there was no difference. One of the theories is that it's actually uh, breast milk uh, that helps seed the gut and that all of the microbes uh, that are necessary uh, already there. Um, and there's even theories that there's some crazy like gut breast connection that allows those microbes to make their way into mom's milk um, and then out uh, to the baby. That also is controversial, um, but I, I find that intriguing. Yes, that sounds very controversial, but intriguing. You're right. Like I, I want to see more <laughs> on that. <laughs> All right, uh, so we have a few questions left. Chris, I'm gonna send this one to you. Why do some medical doctors, including gastroenterologists, not believe in studying the microbiome? I had one gastro tell me that probiotics is just like studying herbs. Mm, yeah, I, I'm sorry you had that experience, first of all. Um, and what it boils down to is our education uh, in medical school. And truthfully, we're not uh, taught much in the way of nutrition, uh, and we're not taught much in the way of microbiome. Uh, and so that bias carries its way through uh, folks' careers and absent a curious mind uh, and, um, you know, proclivity to learn a lot of this stuff independently. Um, it's not part of most physicians' repertoire. And so the frustration that you experience uh, on the patient end, uh, as it turns out, is also frustration on the physician's end because they don't know how to advise. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate. It's something that needs to change. Um, I'm involved in the, the training program at the University of Washington and uh, try to bring the fellows up to speed um, and help to write the uh, microbiome uh, syllabus for the medical students. Um, 
but yeah, it might take a little time. And in, in the meantime, uh, my apologies. Thank you. Yeah, I'm involved in a similar training endeavor over uh, you're at UW, I, I help with the WAMI <laughs> side. Mm. Oh, um, nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah, my, my mentor is, is a faculty member there. And so once every few months, I, I go and give a, I guess, lecture on this. And, and the goal is really to just, uh, it's a special section, right? It's an elective. It, the goal is to get the students to be aware. So when did mm. you go into practice, right? They, they already have some fundamental knowledge and some exposure to it. And it's because just as Dr. Damon mentioned, this is really an education issue. Um, another part of it though, goes back to some of the conversations we have in our industry meetings, which is the reliability mm. of yeah. the data that we put out. Um, in the microbiome sector. And so uh, until there is a little bit more trust that the data we are reporting is reliable and reproducible, I think there will still be some practitioners that will um, be reluctant to, to, you know, fully jump on board. Yeah, I agree. And I would add that uh, Scott and I teach on this in the integrative medicine programs. So uh, the people who are coming back for education and integrative medicine are getting it. And that's another mechanism, right? Because you're working on the, the pipeline, which is absolutely where to start, but people who are already out there need this education as well. So we've got continuing education, we've got degree programs like our integrative medicine program. Um, so we are out of time. I did wanna give everyone a chance to do one last closing remark. Uh, so I'll just go in the order that we presented. So Scott, you are first, one class closing remark. Uh, I just, I wanted to mention something, and this is a bit anecdotal. Um, a couple of years, I don't know if we had mentioned it earlier, but Lee and I are uh, not only colleagues, but partners in life. Lee is my wife. And a couple of years ago, we did a plant-based diet for a week, you know, just, just plant-based for a week. And at the end of that, we did one of the direct-to-consumer at-home gut microbiome tests, and we sent out our fecal sample. We got the report back. And something that I remember that stood out is that in the report, they said your diet is too carnivorous and you need to cut out the animal-based protein. And Hilarious. Eat this was after a week-long plant-based diet. So, you know, just consider that in terms of reliability. And, and I don't mean to, you know, slander any company or doing it wrong. That's just the state of the field we are in right now. That's the best we can do right now. So um, we're progressing in the right direction, but, um, you know, it takes time. Rome wasn't built overnight. Exactly. Yvonne. Yeah, um, I feel like Scott took um, my, the words out of my mouth. But I was just going to again say, you know, Rome wasn't built in a, in a day or overnight, and we really need to give this time. But also, I, I, I personally, I love the microbiome, passionate about it, spends my entire career, not entire, some part of my career studying it and I hope to stay in it forever right but I do have and because I love it like a like a mom that loves a child I can see the weaknesses and I can try to to point it out and and do my bit to fix it and that's kind of where we are at in in the industry so I will say that we should we should be expectant for um, I think advancements, especially towards causation and not just still doing correlation studies. I think we should be expectant um, for, for more along the therapeutics line. Um, and then one area that I'm particularly excited about is diagnostic potential or predictive potential, predictors of long-term health, that potential to use the gut microbiome profiling as a way to do that. Of course, once we work out a lot of the kinks, with method variability, I think it has this powerful way of being able to, to help support holistic and integrative healthcare because if there's anything in the body that is uh, connected to everything, it's the microbiome. I, 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 I think very few, maybe the immune system is the other one, but most other systems in the body don't have the far reaching impacts that gut microbiome does and it's, it's powerful. So I'm looking forward to the next few years with excitement for sure. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so um, the sentiment that I want to express is gratitude. Um, gratitude to um, institutes uh, like Integrative Medicine at George Washington that are actually leading the charge in this education as evidenced by uh, the symposium um, and filling a niche, a niche, so to speak, uh, <laughs> to borrow a, an analogy um, in education. Um, so yeah, thank you, uh, 
to Lee and um, to my co-speakers and uh, to uh, George Washington and uh, frankly, everyone that uh, has stayed to the bitter end here. Um, uh, and, and may uh, this flame that's kindled here today uh, be carried on uh, and grow bigger. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Thank you. That makes my heart feel so good. Uh, I, I echo all of those sentiments, especially the sentiment about maybe feeling a little bit frustrated that we aren't there yet, but knowing that we will get there and that that's just how science works. It takes time. Um, but hopefully things will be moving a little bit faster, right? Over time, we're getting to know more and things will really amp up. I think this is an absolutely super exciting place to be. Uh, like Yvonne said, it touches everything, right? How, how many things can you alter and it, it changes both, you know, your cognitive capability, your, you know, um, ability to uh, lose weight and uh, what your mood is like and uh, how you digest it. Just, it's so promising that once we do have a good understanding of it. I see it as being a huge area for therapeutics with everything else, right? This is not going to fix everything by itself, but this is one of the tools in our toolkits when we're doing a holistic look at someone that we can utilize, a, a lever we can pull. And so with that, I will just close us off and thank everyone for joining us. I, it seems like you got as much out of it as we did from the comments in the chat, which I love. Um, and if this is something you're interested in hearing more in, we would love to get feedback um, because I'm sure this group would love to get back together and chit chat again, even if it was just for an hour. <laughs> thank you all for coming. I couldn't done it without you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. It was a pleasure. Thanks all.